now. Come on. Hello and welcome to the conversation. I'm Heil Russell. And I'm Cameron. Cameron, hi, how you doing? Good, good. Um, wish I could think of something clever. Well, that's okay. You don't need to think about anything clever because tonight we're talking Mario Kart 64. And it's pretty basic. You're just kind of going around in a circle three times. So uh, I anticipate this to be a nice short episode. And then uh, we'll, you know, call it a day. Sounds good. All right. All right. So Mario Kart is a game with go-karts. And uh, yeah, it's got uh, eight funny cartoon characters. And they race a bit. And they throw, uh, they throw the corpses of uh, turtles. And they throw banana peels at each other. And uh, lots of laughs are had. And then you, uh, you kind of turn it off the game. This has been a File 2 production. <laughs> Perico. All right, I guess we should actually put some effort into this. All right, well, 20 years ago this week... Jesus Christ. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you know, I've been having, like, uh, the, these uh, lower back issues, and uh, I, I realized it's from when I uh, slipped and fell on the uh, the ice last month, but... It just makes me feel so old, and and now I'm talking about a game that came out 20 years ago that I swear I still think of as a new game. So, yeah, here we are, the uh, the slow encroachment of death. As we talk about Mario Kart 64, 20 years ago this week, it was released in the West. Uh, I believe it had a release date of late 96 in Japan. It... it, it Definitely came out in 96 because the title screen always said 1996. But um, we here uh, outside of Japan did not get it until February 1997. It came out the week of Valentine's Day and uh, or Cobcock Day, even though we didn't really uh, celebrate Cobcock Day back then, of course. But uh, historically, it was the week of Cobcock Day. So uh, this, this was a... a f- pretty damn important game and i think more so than uh it it would be for even mario fans like the the hardcore mario fanatics this game has a bigger significance arguably for uh donkey kong fans um first and foremost i guess wario fans maybe if you want to split hair if you want to really divide up all the different fandoms sure but um, if we're just looking at uh, what it means for Donkey Kong, Mario Kart 64 is uh, pretty damn important um, in the grand scheme of things. And uh, that's something we're going to be discussing this episode, uh, as well as uh, just kind of the, the, the history of the game, uh, our thoughts about it. This is not going to be a four-part spotlight episode like we do for the Donkey Kong Country games. This is because uh, <laughs> there, there's not that much to talk about. I mean, Mario Kart 64, it's uh, it's a game. I, I mean, I think we just say this up front. It's a game I think we both hold in high esteem and have a lot of warm nostalgia for. But it's also not something we could really stretch past one week as far as discussion goes. We're going to be having a Diddy Kong Racing Spotlight episode at the end of the year to celebrate that game's 20th anniversary. And I foresee that at least being a two-parter because there's a little bit more to discuss there. Mario Kart 64, again, it's kind of bare bones. It's not, I mean, bare bones in a great way. It, it, it's I'm always tough to, it. it's always tough to go into this because it's like, I, I really do like Mario Kart 64 a lot. And I think it's very, very easy when you're in an environment with fans of both to turn a discussion about Mario Kart 64 into a pissing contest with Diddy Kong Racing and vice yeah. versa. Well, and it's, uh, it's kind of unfortunate because for most of 1997, this was the game. I mean, it, it brought Donkey Kong Country fans together with Mario fans. And then, of course, in November of that year, we got Diddy Kong Racing, and all of a sudden, it became territorial. And I, I remember, you know, immediately putting Diddy Kong Racing up on the, uh, this pedestal above Mario Kart 64 and all of the faults that Diddy Kong Racing made apparent in Mario Kart 64 were not apparent to me before Diddy Kong Racing so it's not really fair to Mario Kart 64 to have that comparison and to be fair Mario Kart 64 does do some things better than Diddy Kong Racing so there's definitely room for both in the the pantheon of your video game library so 
Um, I, I don't want to turn this into, well, Diddy Kong Racing uh, surely did that much better. That, that's not what this episode is going to be about. We are probably going to bring up Diddy Kong Racing every now and then because the comparisons are always going to be there. But I really wanted this to be more of a celebration of a Mario Kart 64 uh, above all else. So right. that that being said, um, well, let's just get into it. <laughs> let's immediately tank that. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's <laughs> let's get into it. Um, first of all, let's talk a little bit about the history of Mario Kart because this is uh, something that I don't think a lot of people realize when it comes to what we cover on DK Vine and on the conversation, and that's Mario Kart 64 is the first Mario Kart game we discuss in what we consider to be the Donkey Kong universe. No, we know full well there is a Mario Kart game before this in the, the Super Nintendo classic Super Mario Kart. We don't actually cover Super Mario Kart, though, which kind of makes it a little bit weird when we, we we cover every Mario Kart game but Super Mario Kart. And the reason for that is, is quite simple. While Super Mario Kart does have Donkey Kong Jr. in the game, it predates the rare version of Donkey Kong, the modern Donkey Kong, which, you know, you can argue whether that's Donkey Kong Jr. or not, but we only cover rare's Donkey Kong, starting with Donkey Kong Country. So Mario Kart 64 is the first Mario Kart game we cover, and it's also the first Mario game we cover, which we'll be getting into that uh, enormously important piece of history. But... Super Mario Kart came out in what was it was it 1992 it came out or was it 92 I I want to say 92 Okay yeah I, I want to say It was it was fairly early on it still got that sort of early Super Nintendo game aesthetic Yeah kind where of Where you can well, tell they weren't I mean that's mode 7 for you I mean it, it, I was going to compa- immediately compare it to F0 and I was like well there's a reason for that Heil. Um I was actually going to talk about like the thing where like skin tones are slightly off and the sprites are kind of like a little bit more off model than they would be later on granted they're they're pretty there's some pretty great animation in it but still No you're you're right it definitely does feel more like a first generation Super Nintendo game um than what came later when they could really like push the hardware to do some pretty amazing things and granted i mean mode 7 itself was pretty amazing i think less so with the uh, super mario kart than it was with f0 but uh, I, mean, I think i generally think of like uh, around super metroid as the time when like they started to really figure out what they were doing with art direction like i know it's various different teams and such yeah. but that i think is what i that's the kind of game i start to think of as a a game when Super Nintendo de- developers found their footing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 1994, yeah, was was I? I mean, I of course I associate 94 as the dividing line in the Super Nintendo history, anyway, because of where my obsessions lie. But <laughs> Super Metroid is definitely uh, probably the game most people would point to. Uh, the I, I rented Super Mario Kart when it came out, and. Um, you know, funny enough, when I think about Super Mario Kart's release, I don't remember Nintendo actually promoting it as much as I do Sega making fun of it in their commercials. And um, I, I don't know if you've ever seen this commercial, Cameron, and I don't even know. I think this was just a general Sega commercial, but they were showing uh, side-by-side comparisons of the Super Nintendo with the Sega Genesis. So they had some sort of, like macho, high-octane racing game on the Sega Genesis, and they're comparing it with Super Mario Kart and just kind of giving the impression that the Super Nintendo is an inferior piece of hardware that can't handle these badass racing games. And, uh, I mean, completely unfair, which, I mean, Sega's advertisements in those day, days were kind of shitty. I, I, and I say this as a kid who was a Nintendo loyalist back then. But I always felt I mean, like... I'm impressed knowing now how how well they were able to market that when, honestly, you look at the hardware specs and the Super Nintendo had the Genesis beat pretty handily in almost yeah. every respect. It's, it's weird that Sega were like the bullies, but it, it was effective. I mean, I, I remember older gamers or gamers who wanted to give the impression that they were older and more sophisticated you know, usually gravitated towards the Genesis. Then the Genesis had a lot of great games, so it's not 
this is not a pissing contest either. Um, but uh, I, I, I just remember, yes, yeah, Sega used Super Mario Kart as a reason you shouldn't purchase the Super Nintendo, which is so weird because so many people consider that game a Stone Cold classic, and I don't even remember what game Sega was promoting. And granted, I mean, I'm a Nintendo kid, uh, you know. So, yeah, I, but uh, I, I was aware of Super Mario Kart, and I wanted to rent it, and um, rent it I did. I, I think I rented it at least twice from Blockbuster back... Those were the days, man, when you could just, you know, walk into a brick-and-mortar store and uh, pick the game off the shelf, and it was such an exciting feeling. Ooh, I'm going to have this game for three nights, or however long it was. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 was, uh, it was a cheap way to I, – I know I've talked about this on the conversation, but it was a cheap way to kind of convince your parents a game was worth buying. And if you really wanted a game, you really had to show a lot of interest level during the time you rented it and just, like – that's how I got Donkey Kong Country for Christmas in uh, 1994. I rented it uh, a few weeks before Christmas, uh, before Thanksgiving. I mean, it was it was right when the game came out, and um, just blown away by it. And my mom, uh, I didn't even ask for it because I, I, I don't even know why I didn't ask for it. I think the stores, I just assumed the stores would be sold out. And but my mom went out and got it on Black Friday and um, changed the direction I guess that, of my life. That is a really good like benchmark for a little kid's attention span if if you wave a game in front of them for three days and they're still playing it and haven't moved on to something else maybe they actually like it yeah and i played i played a lot of super mario kart i remember it wasn't enough for me to actually like campaign to own the game you know but um (laughs) it was definitely worth another rental i I got bored with it uh, over time though and i think one of the reasons was um it just ultimately wasn't as captivating as I would have liked it to be. And Mode 7, for as impressive as it was back then, it honestly never held my attention. And, and I mean, I, I was a, I was the right age for it when it came out. I mean, I'm not like a, a younger gamer who can only look back at these Mode 7 games after having played, you know, these 3D racers. I, I, Mode 7 really didn't, like hold my attention enough where I was willing to get good at the racing games. So I th- kind of just like, I-, I played around with Super Mario Kart for a while and then uh, rented it twice, but then I just really wanted nothing more to do with it. And um, I, th- I think what kind of holds the Mode 7 back for me, because I-, I do like it in certain other games, um, like the F-Zeros and even Mario Kart Super Circuit, I Su- really Su- love it Super in that Circuit, game. yeah. No, but Super Circuit always felt like they were adding that layer of sophistication it, from Mario Kart 64. Back I feel into like the I, game. I feel like I know what it is, and it's the fact that 50% of your screen real estate is devoted to the map at the bottom. Yeah. In Super Mario Kart. I, th- I th- maybe you're right. It something always just felt off about the game, and so many people revere it. And what was shocking to me was how many people revered it when Mario Kart 64 came out over Mario Kart 64 like they they turned it into well Super Mario Kart is the better game and for me it was no contest I mean Mario Kart 64 thrilled me in a way Super Mario Kart couldn't but I, that's kind of a that's kind of especially odd for me because like Su- Super Mario Kart was kind of before my time it was off my radar mm. like I had a Super Nintendo but it had been I got it in the mid-90s, not the early 90s. And I had seen Mario Kart 64 by that time, so Mario Kart 64 was the game you wanted to play, you wanted to look at. Right. Like, I think when I when I finally found out about Super Mario Kart, it was just sort of this weird curiosity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that's really what the game was. It, it felt weird that this game even existed. We take it for granted now that Mario Kart is just such an ingrained part of not only video game culture, but I would say popular culture in general. And it was just a weird curiosity when it came out. Like, really? Like, a Mario racing game and they're in go-karts? It, it kind of felt like a little kitty when... It, it came out, and I, I was a kid, but even then, I was just like, why can't they be racing something cooler than go-karts? I don't know, but um, it, it's funny how quickly it, it's, it 
and I think Mario Kart 64 more than anything helped it seep into the popular imagination. But we, we can't dismiss Super Mario Kart laying the groundwork for that. Now granted, Super Mario Kart also owes influence to Rare itself with the uh, RC program. Um, a, a lot of what Mar Super Mario Kart did was pioneered by RC program. So, um, and it's funny looking at the influences of Mario Kart 64 uh, when I was, you know, reading up on the game prior to doing this episode. Um, they they stated that they wanted Mario Kart 64 to control like you were um, s steering RC racers and. Um, so it's just funny, the, the levels of influence that go back and forth between Rare and Nintendo when it comes to the uh, the kart racing genre. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I rented Mar Super Mario Kart, and of course I played as Donkey Kong Jr. Because um, even then, I loved primates, and if I could play as a gorilla, I would play as the gorilla or monkey or whatever it gave me the option as. Um, there was that surfing game, surf and skateboard game um, that came out for the NES where you, I don't know, it was, it was, a, it was a weird game. I, we've talked about it here on the show before, but it was a, like it was a surf and skate game where um, very, very late 80s, early 90s. But in uh, the surfing mode, you could play as a surfing gorilla, not Funky Kong, but uh, maybe an, an inspiration for Funky Kong. And so, of course, I always wanted to play as a surfing gorilla. So, yeah, Super Mario Kart was uh, definitely a, a game that was a bit of a curiosity in that regard that Donkey Kong Jr. was playable because this was at the complete, like, bottom of the well as far as the Donkey Kong series goes. Nothing was coming out as far as Donkey Kong was concerned uh, during this point in time. You know, after the arcade trilogy and after the uh, conversions on the uh, NES, it really was nothing for Donkey Kong. He would he would show up in like cameos every now and then, like in Tetris, or um, I don't know. What he was he, kind of like a he's kind of what uh, what like Pit from Kid Icarus was for you. So he was just sort of a a background gag, a relic. Yeah, in... a, a relic that they weren't really interested in devoting time and resources to, but they'd throw him in there whenever they wanted a cheeky reference. And uh, to have Donkey Kong Jr., of all things, playable in this game. Because I did have uh, Donkey Kong Classics on the NES, so I had uh, Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. And uh, it, it was the NES Donkey Kong, though, so it was missing a, a, uh, the pie stage. And um, so, I, I mean, I, I obviously knew who Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. were, so it was kind of mind-blowing to see that recognized. It was like, oh my god, Donkey Kong Jr. is in this game. And... Um, yeah, so that I, I played as Dunk Kong Jr. and even then I recognized, you know, oh, he's a bit slower and uh, than than say Toad, but um, I I was uh, dedicated even then to my gorillas. It was also just uh, coincidentally convenient for the narrative we'd uh, later weave that uh, he's a lot bigger bigger than most of the characters in the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, anyway, so Super Mario Kart was just, you know, a game that came out. A lot of people revere it, uh, and it, it it was kind of like an exciting rental game for me, but nothing of any grand permanence. So, when the N64 was uh, being hyped, uh, you know, it was 1995 into 1996, before the system actually came out, and Nintendo Power and, and all its various uh, propaganda outlets were showing off the games that were coming out for it. One of the games was a Super Mario Kart R, the early iteration of what would become Mario Kart 64. And I don't know, I, I never knew what the R stood for, so I, I looked it up, and apparently the R stands for Rendered, which, had they gone with this name, it would have literally spent Super Mario Kart Rendered, which is a terrible, terrible name for a game. <laughs> That's uh, that's that's so weird. I I knew about the original name, but I never really considered why they did it. Um, and I think the reason I just sort of let it pass, which is kind of odd and is in, in retrospect, is because I knew about uh, Sonic R for the Saturn, where I think obviously in that game it probably stood for racing yeah. because it was a racing game. But Mario Kart R, yeah, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense there. 
And um, I always just assumed it was some sort of like racing terminology that I I didn't know. This was you know before, or, or I... even like uh, F zero X. Just the letter was more random. Yeah, th this is before. Wi yeah, this is before Wikipedia and the whole of human knowledge being at your fingertips. I mean, the internet was in its infancy back then, and you know, but. So I couldn't just look up what R might mean, you know. So it, and if Nintendo Power didn't explain it to me, I could only have wild assumptions. So I thought it was just some sort of crazy uh, professional racing term, you know, like a Grand Prix or, or something that doesn't really make a lot of sense, or but you just roll Pro-Am. Pro, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So, and uh, it, it's funny now... Um, since uh, marrying Michelle, um, she's actually really super into Formula One racing, um, so I, I've gotten into it as well. And it's it's funny um, actually learning a bit of the terminology um, that has been elusive to me all this time when racing has been such a part of my life just because of video games. So anyway, so Super Mario Kart R. <laughs> which sounds like a, a, a like a, a pirate re re rendition of it which I don't know maybe we'll get Sea of Thieves Racing as a spinoff but uh, Mario Kart Super Mario Kart R uh, had Mario, Luigi, Peach, Toad, Yoshi and Bowser but switched up two of the characters from the original uh, replacing Donkey Kong Jr. was Wario who was, you know, having his big moment in the sun in the uh, early to mid '90s um, after, you know, taking over the Super Mario Land series, and I think this was Wario's uh, like first appearance um, alongside the rest of the Mario cast. And like, mine, mine is stuff like Wario's Woods, where he would like maybe appear with Toad or something. You know, th this was like his big coming out party. So he replaced Donkey Kong Jr., which kind of made sense at the time because. Donkey Kong Jr. had been, you know, arguably retired as a character or transformed into the current adult Donkey Kong, something that, you know, nobody has come to a consensus on 20 years later, and, and had his own series that was under the auspices of Rare. So, yeah, it makes sense to replace him with Wario. And replacing Koopa Troopa was another contemporary pick at the time, uh, Kamek, the Magic Koopa, from Yoshi's Island. Yeah. So, yeah. and it, when you do look back at Super Mario Kart, it is Koopa Troopa is definitely the odd one out in that cast. Well, yeah, he always felt like the, a lazy choice when you could have gone with so many other characters. Um, just off the top of my head, anybody from Super Mario Brothers Two would have been more appealing to me than Koopa Troopa. Like uh, Birdo, obviously, but Mouser. You got to understand, early '90s. Like, the iconic Mario characters, especially for those living in the West, were what the Super Mario Brothers Super Show peddled to you. So, the Super Mario Brothers 2 cast, like Mouser, were, like, big-time Mario characters. And it's, it's kind of funny how, with the exception of Birdo and, you know, the Shy Guys and, and some of the other drones in that game, nobody has stuck around, which... It, it, it it's it just so disheartening to my childhood to see how skewed my perceptions of what Mario Cannon actually was were and um, how the Japanese and Nintendo themselves actually saw things uh, but yeah I, I liked that they replaced Koopa Troop with Kamek because obviously Kamek was a big deal at the time and uh, the, the other like major difference with Super Mario Kart R, well, major difference, minor difference, was uh, the feather item was also going to be included. The feather item from the original Super Mario Kart that let you uh, jump high and um, leap over barriers in the track. It's such a very situational item. I can see why they dropped it. Oh, everybody, like, again, aficionados of the original Super Mario Kart bitched and moaned about... Um, the feather being excluded from Mario Kart 64. And I never understood. It was like a uh, token purist, you know, who can never let go that Tom Bombadil was uh, excised from the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you know? Um, it's like, let, let it go, man. Let it go. It, it's not that big of a deal. I feel like it's a... I mean, I I can't remember. Did they bring it back in Mario Kart 8 or something recently? I, 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 I think it's, it came back. It, it, it's definitely... Uh, May, 
made, made its way I, back. I into honestly one of the games. cannot remember why I think that, but I, I was just thinking to myself, it made sense to me that they cut it because, in just my limited imagination at the time, I would think, yeah, that's an item that doesn't really translate well to a 3D environment because the whole point of it was you would skip over these small little pits or barriers with it. Right. In Super Mario Kart. And this was another one of those, uh, again, things that was really odd to me going... Because, like I said, I I didn't play Super Mario Kart first. I played the series out of order. And when I finally went back to Super Mario Kart, not really knowing much about it, I got this feather item, and I'm thinking, like, oh, cool, I, I remember what this did in Super Mario World. When, what's going to happen when I use this? Am I going to, like, get a flying car or something and it, it, I remember hitting the button and it, it just jumped a little bit <laughs> and right. I, I, I just remember thinking to myself that that's it mm -hmm. that's it yeah yeah <laughs> and uh, I, I thought it, you know you'd get a cape at least that would be pretty cool um, yeah and also you know Mario Kart 64 gave us the option of hopping slightly which let you you know evade um terrain and even uh, items if you were uh, especially skilled so uh yeah there's no need to have the feather and i just don't understand why they became such a rallying cry among the purists it just and, and i grant i say this because again i wasn't online at the time i i learned that this was a controversy from reading gaming magazines that weren't nintendo power so things like uh, game pro uh, electronic gaming monthly uh, you know that things like that and they were written by older gamers who you know had had come of age um with the original super mario kart and were just like bitching and tearing mario kart 64 apart for these minor variances from the original game that weren't needed and it, essentially it was just the the equivalent of people bitching on an uh internet forum but with the auspices of being a professional because they're writing in the game magazine so it's when when gaming journalism was was uh, younger than it is today, and and um, made me less polished as a result. But um, anyway, the era of screenshots being actual screenshots from a camera. Yeah, yeah, like like DK Vine pulled in his earliest days. <laughs> oh, our friend, where have you gone, our? Oh yeah, you became Barack Obama. Well, where have you gone, our friend? We need you. <laughs> um, let's come back uh. from vacation, our friend. Um, so, anyway, that that was the uh, what we read about Super Mario Kart R in the early days, and then it became Mario Kart 64. And as I uh, have shared on many recent conversations. We first learned, at least in America, at least if you're a subscriber to Nintendo Power, we first learned about Donkey Kong being included in Mario Kart 64 in the Donkey Kong Country 3... It was either the Donkey Kong Country 3 issue or the issue after the Donkey Kong Country 3 issue, but it came, the week, came to subscribers in Nintendo Power like the day before Donkey Kong Country 3 was released in the States. So there, there was like a very short time window where we learned Donkey Kong was in Mario Kart 64 and then Donkey Kong Country 3 came out. So uh, whatever the publication schedule, it might have been the December issue of Nintendo Power, but whatever it is, it, it was right next to Donkey Kong Country 3's release. And so basically they swapped out Kamek for Donkey Kong and it was the modern Donkey Kong, Rare's Donkey Kong, uh, the Donkey Kong Country Donkey Kong, as uh, Miyamoto called him, Super Donkey Kong. Um, when and, and he's uh, yeah, he's credited in the in the credits mm -hmm. as being Rare's Donkey Kong. Uh, I think the exact quote is a uh, Donkey Kong 3D model provided courtesy of Rare UK. Yeah, it, it's funny. I remember having conversations with people because, of course, I was I was a Donkey Kong Nazi at that point, and I was I remember like talking about Mario Kart 64 with people and I would say, I, I wonder if Rare is working on it because Donkey Kong is in the game and they had no idea what I was talking about. Um, and uh, so actually seeing that in the credits was like a minor moment of validation for young me. Um, yeah, I think that was definitely one of the first 
things that stood out in video game credits to me when I saw that. Yeah. And that, at that point, I wasn't even really cognizant of the difference between game developers and publishers. Because, well, I mean, I was still young and stupid. I didn't really get it just yet. And I think that was one of the little upticks that got me to pay more attention to the role of Rare in my favorite games. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that Rare was what made me learn that, oh, Nint you mean Nintendo isn't just making all of these games? You know, obviously I knew, like, about third-party developers or, or licensed developers, but, you know... You, you buy a Donkey Kong game, you just think, oh, this this blanket organization Nintendo is making it. And, yeah, it, it, that's what made me pay attention to this shit. And um, especially the, the, these rare people. These rare wear people, as the logo said. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Miyamoto explained that, you know, one of the late... And this is one of the late changes they made to this game was switching out Kamek for, as Miyamoto said, Super Donkey Kong. And I have to view this as nothing more than a blatant cash grab because Donkey Kong was super, super hot at this time. Uh, I don't mean like sexually arousing, maybe to some people. Um, well, the the butt render is the kind butt, of butt. I mean, <laughs> juiciest butt in all of video games. I mean, but... all you had to do to sell people was say, "This is a game where you can look at the back of Donkey Kong all the time." <laughs> right. <laughs> but um. I mean, th this was coming off of the period where it really did feel like Donkey Kong was Nintendo's mascot, Donkey and Diddy. And, I mean, for, for like a two-year period from Donkey Kong Country's release to the Nintendo 64's launch, Donkey and Diddy were kind of the focus of Nintendo. Even Super Mario World 2 didn't really make that much of a huge impression. Um, I mean, it did, Relatively obviously. speaking. Relatively yeah. speaking. And... That was more of Yoshi's game anyway, so... And uh, I actually have an anecdote that kind of ties into this. Sure. That, like, uh, I, I don't know if I've explained this on the show. I know I've definitely gone over it in forms or some such, but, uh, like, Donkey Kong Country was, I think, my first experience to exposure to Donkey Kong the character mm -hmm. and Donkey Kong the name. So for a good long while, I had no idea the arcade game even existed, that there was any sort of tie to Mario at all in of any historical significance or otherwise. I think when DK, in 1999, when DK Arcade showed up in DK64, then I started to put two and two together. But I had played Mario Kart 64 first, and I remember seeing Donkey Kong there, and you kind of have this moment where you think, well... Well, what the hell is he doing there? <laughs> and eventually, I my mind just settled on, well, Donkey Kong is really super popular right now. And he was in a game known for being like having this sort of 3D effect they're going for here. And I just rolled with it. I just yeah. said, yeah, this is just cashing in on Donkey Kong's popularity. And, you know, he's just he just here to sell more copies. <laughs> So cynical. Uh, no, but it's funny. We could even apply a real-life event a a as a retcon to soothe our troubled Donkey Kong fan brains by saying, you know, they, they've now that they've inserted Link and the, uh, the Inklings and um, Animal Crossing characters into Mario Kart 8, we can just say, well, they did it first with Donkey Kong in Mario Kart 64. They're completely separate franchises. Why would Mario? Why would Donkey Kong be in Mario Kart? It was because he was popular, and he set the stage for Link and the others being in Mario Kart. So, um, <laughs> helps me sleep at night. So yeah, um, but yeah, Donkey Kong Country Mania. This, I mean, that's really what spurred them. Because again, Donkey Kong was very nearly not in Mario Kart 64 at all. It was a late decision. I don't, I don't know when they decided to do it because, again, they kind of uh, revealed this to us in the West right around the time of the Japanese release for uh, Mario Kart 64. So I, I don't know when the Switch actually happened, but, um, yeah, it, 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 it was kind of shocking. And I remember, again, as I related just recently on the show, the false notion that Donkey Kong was going to be in Super Mario RPG 
braced myself for an event like this earlier in 1996. So I was already ready for something like this to happen. So when it actually did happen, I was just like, oh, damn. Okay, well, here we are. And it was also, oh, damn, I have to buy a Nintendo 64 much sooner than I anticipated. <laughs> Which, when you're uh, a cash-strapped 13-year-old, uh, um, that's a much bigger deal. <laughs> yeah, good grief. How much did that retail for when it first came out? Oh, I don't even remember. But I, I mean, feel like it was, was it over 300 I feel like. I, I just remember having to shovel a lot of snow that winter. Like, I, I had to earn money from my parents, so I did a lot of chores I wouldn't have normally had to do to uh, to earn that money, and I, I worked myself to the bone to get a Nintendo 64 uh, by the time of Mario Kart 64's release. Oh, and uh, oh so- sorry, I just looked it up. It says it was 199 so 199, I was yeah. To, yeah, to, yeah, I was gonna say that 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 seems seems a little steep for a '96, but um, yeah, 199 U, uh, U.S. currency. Uh, so yeah, did a lot did a lot of work around the the old childhood home then, and um, had, had a jar where I put all my money, you know, my Nintendo 64 fund, and then after I got a Nintendo 64, I had a Nintendo 64 DD. A disk drive fund, which never went anywhere. I don't even remember what I ended up using that money on, but it definitely wasn't a 64 DD. I, I uh, hope you put it toward Mario Kart Double Dash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I did have the N64 by the time the second week of February '97 rolled around, and I got Mario Kart 64 on launch too. So, um, I maybe I like uh. I, got, I was I was a good con man as the only child in my uh, my household, so maybe I convinced my parents to buy Mario Kart 64 to me as a Valentine's Day gift. I, I don't know how I actually got it on launch, <laughs> but because uh, uh, you know the nice thing about having my birthday in November was I always got the uh, the Donkey Kong Country games as they came out as birthday gifts. So um, minus the original, which was a Christmas gift, but. Anyway, so Donkey Kong in Mario Kart 64. Cameron, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on this episode was because you are kind of the expert when it comes to talking about Donkey Kong models and models of characters throughout the entire history of the series and the various uh, games they appear in. So since this was the first time Rare's Donkey Kong appeared in a non-Rare game, even though Rare did apparently provide the 3D model. Um, Talk to us about the model for a bit. Um, What what are some interesting things we should know? Well, uh, well, first off, it's kind of weird in that, yes, Rare provided the model for Donkey Kong, and you can can tell, but uh, it doesn't quite match up with either the the model from DKC1 or the promo model for DKC2 and uh, the and 3 it's a uh, it's kind of a it's kind of almost sort of scaled back a little bit to i'm not sure what the goal was maybe just to make him more uniform with the rest of the Mario cast mhm um it, it's almost sort of like a in-between state between DKC1 and DKC2 because it has a lot of the advancements from DKC2 that weren't in the original model just because they were sort of just figuring things out. Um, like all of his uh, all of his uh, toes and fingers are connected to his hands and feet and meshed with his arms and legs a bit. In the original uh, Donkey Kong Country... Um, Things hadn't quite gotten that far yet. You still had this sort of effect where Donkey Kong's hand looked like a like a segmented bone. <laughs> I think uh, my, my favorite like reference to that was uh, sausage fingers. Um, I think that's from Josh from the Geek Critique. <laughs> yeah, well, they have that, and uh, they. Uh, they fixed up his uh, in, in DKC one Donkey Kong's, uh, for lack of a better word, his uh, his cuffs, the little tufts of where his fur sort of runs out, and you get into the skin of his arms and feet. It, it's a lot less pronounced in the in the Mario Kart sixty four 
model than it is in the original. They toned that shape down. And uh, I'll just cut to the chase and get to the biggest difference um, from DKC 2 and 3 to this model. Uh, th there's no rendered fur on this model at all. Yeah. It's a, it's a flat texture, and uh, oddly, it doesn't really look like the same texture that was in DKC 1. And uh, I realize how... Uh, how well suited this conversation is to an audio show. I'm, I'm basically, <laughs> I'm basically just captioning the old Tumblr article, uh, which uh, you can find these features at a uh, dkvine.tumblr.com, um, <laughs> uh, where I did a character design study of Donkey Kong through his various appearances through, uh, I want to say, uh, Super Smash Brothers for Wii U. Um, but it's this, it's a flat texture that doesn't quite look like the the original Donkey Kong Country 1 model either. Um, it, the original Donkey Kong Country 1 model, I think it even had some sort of, even though it was a flat texture, it had some sort of light, uh, looked like it had a sort of light bump map to it. Mm -hmm. To give it some dimension. This really doesn't seem to, and... It's just a very different texture, and I kind of want to say, like, looking at it now, it, it doesn't quite look like fur when you get all that close to it. What it actually reminds me of is the the water texture you'd see in, like, a, a game like Banjo-Kazooie that denoted, like, a, a toxic sludge that you definitely shouldn't <laughs> jump into. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. For me, I was like, always resembled sand or something like or like I, I don't know or like a like a mic like a like a windows 98 tiled wallpaper yeah 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 it's... um no i mean I, I i think they were trying to go for a, a middle ground like you said and obviously they couldn't do rendered fur in this game um for one thing, they had to keep it consistent with the other characters. And two, I don't think Mario Kart 64 would have been able to handle rendered fur. Um, although I'm not, you know, I'm not the expert on that. But and, uh, um, I would, I would be very curious um, to to know if all these changes were made on Rare's end or Nintendo's end at this point in time. Because you also have to consider. Like, they would have needed lead-in time to send this to them, um, even though this was a fairly last-minute addition, apparently. Um, I'm just wondering on whose side of the process all these conscious changes were made. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure, you know, Rare had some direction as far as uh, what they were and were not allowed to do with the model. Um, but this is probably the best Donkey Kong looked in... Um, what we call cameo games, you know, the the Mario or broader you know, franchise crossovers that um, Donkey Kong and later his extended cast started which, appearing in. But, which is weird because it's like saying the best artwork you ever drew was the one you traced over somebody else's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, this, this is the most authentic Donkey Kong looks to the way Rare conceived him. Um, probably up until... Ooh, I don't even know. Like, it would have to be the GameCube era. Um, maybe even Brawl. I don't know. Like, uh, it was a while before they were able to get a, a model that looked anywhere as good as this. But, um... Yeah, Brawl was probably... I don't know in terms of quality, but it was probably not until Super Smash Bros. Brawl that something recaptured the feel of what Rare had done with the model. Yeah. And, like, uh, the one in Brawl you could kind of squint at and say, yeah, that looks like the Super Nintendo Donkey Kong. Right, right. And, of course, of course, by the time you get to the GameCube era, then you've got that kind of the more uniform looks um, that, that were rolling out for the Mario cast and Donkey Kong cast. And um, Donkey Kong kind of got the bigger, um, the bigger chin, um, kind of the bulbous, um, more bulbous look uh, underneath his mouth. So, um as yeah, I mean, if you really want a good rundown of this, again, check out dkvine.com slash Tumblr because Cameron has did magnificent write-ups of uh, of Donkey Kong's visual history, starting with Donkey Kong Country. So yeah, anyway, yeah, I love the way Donkey Kong looks in this game, but 
it should be pointed out too the weird design the choices of Mario Kart 64 in general because all of the characters are essentially rendered sprites and they are in a world that is polygonal so you've got this weird kind of hybrid hybridization between um, the, the look of Donkey Kong Country kind of and the look of the Nintendo 64 I mean it's kind of similar to what uh, Killer Instinct Gold did as well yeah, yeah. Um, for me, th there's a certain feel to Mario Kart 64 that has never been replicated in a Mario Kart game since maybe uh, Mario Kart Super Circuit, just based on it being that weird hybrid of uh, Super Mario Kart and Mario Kart 64. But there's a certain dreamlike aesthetic to the game that I can't really describe, but I think a large part of that has to do with that kind of graphical mashup, that the weird contrasting styles between sprites and polygons that, I don't know, it, it, there, there, there is this kind of magic to the game, both visually and in the music, that give, gives it a feeling like no other Mario Kart games before or since. A am yeah, I, I just to... crazy here, or? Well, I... Let me see if I kind of see where you're coming from. I I do find the, the pre-rendered characters on the 3D environment. I'm kind of curious if this is just because Mario Kart 64 was one of my earliest three-dimensional games. Usually when I see games use that sort of sprite polygon mix, I pick up on it right away and it bugs the crap out of me. Like a... Like, I'll, I'll give the example, and maybe this is just because they are, aren't doing it uh, all that well, uh, New Super Mario Brothers on the on the DS. It's mm -hmm. like, it's blisteringly obvious which enemies are and environments are 2D and which ones are 3D. Right. Um, Mario Kart 64, I was a dumb kid and bought for a while that these were 3D characters. Yeah. <laughs> um, and to this day, even though I've kind of got it pegged what they did it doesn't really bother me doesn't in bother me sense, yeah. the way other games do you get like a few hiccups now and then where like the angle of the camera shifts and you wonder why the back wheels of carts are sitting off the ground because they only did them from one angle but overall it works pretty well for what it is yeah, when I was promoting this episode um, earlier today, I, I grabbed a screenshot of um, the, the podium scene, you know, the trophy presentation, and I just noticed for the first time that the back wheels on the carts are kind of s sitting up off the podium because they couldn't position the characters any other way. And I was just like, oh my god, I never noticed that. But it's it just just something you don't pick up on. If you're not really looking for the flaws, they're not going to be uh, readily apparent to you. Right. In incidentally, it just a, a funny thing I picked up on from that same scene. Um, I replayed a bit of this game over the weekend to prepare for this episode. And uh, I know that if you finish fourth place in the overall rankings of a cup, which is honestly kind of hard to do because if you get below fifth place in any race the game kind of gives you the option to try again right you can't you kind of have to you kind of have to either you kind of have to have the patience to let yourself fail to do that you get this kind of like dark comedy scene where like a, the dejected driver goes off screen and gets blown up by a, a bomb mob cart yeah yeah from um, uh, from battle mode right well, I just noticed in the in the scene where you win, you can still see the dejected fourth place driver sitting off to the side mm -hmm. in one yeah. of the in one of the far away shots. And uh, I'd never noticed that before. And obviously, the camera's turned away when they get blown up. But just a just a neat little thing I hadn't noticed before. Yeah, I I remember trying to finish a race in fourth place just to see what would happen. That's exactly um, what I did too. Yeah, it was it was like in Donkey Kong Country 2 trying to beat the game with uh, no hero coins to see what the uh, 
Cranky's Video Game Hero results screen would look like and see who would be the character up on the podium. It was Link. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, the, the, the mishmash of the graphical styles doesn't bother me and I think just adds to the game's weird charm. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny because starting with Double Dash, I feel like Mario Kart just lost some of the the magic that it had um there, there was definitely a significant art direction shift and yeah it kind of it, it not as not as extreme as say like ocarina of time to wind waker and not nearly as successful <laughs> um but um mario kart 64 and granted a lot of this was just informed by my childhood imagination where you kind of imagine an early 3D game looking better than it does. I kind of got the sense of like light realism in Mario Kart 64 compared to um, other Mario Kart games around it. Like uh, like we've, we've talked up the way Mario Kart 8 looks now and that is I think in my mind's eye how Mario Kart 64 looked at the time. And I think part of that is this was again the early 3D age when they were still figuring out like what textures are appropriate to put on objects, what looks convincing, what can we get away with that's not going to cause our hardware to burst into flames. Yeah. Well, I also do think too that this is that this weird era of Mario where you you've by making that transition into 3D, a lot of the um, earlier Mario aesthetics were still there too before it kind of gave way to mm, so the more cartoony um, elements that started, you know, creeping in um, later on, but especially in the, the GameCube and Wii eras. Um, so you kind of had this weird uh, hybridization there too of. Yeah, realism. Oh, I mean, cartoony realism, but realism on the same, and and less less wacky elements that were still there, but they weren't like um, accentuated like they were in Double Dash, where everything had eyeballs and or you know grinning faces, and um, it just seemed like a absurd world. Where Mario Kart 64 at least had the impression of again a. a uh, an exaggerated world that felt very dreamlike, but one that still had uh, an air of plausibility to it. Right, and I I kind of see the the fantasy aesthetic as a way to uh, in games like Mario Kart Double Dash and later Mario Kart Wii the more colorful basic aesthetic as a way to get around your own con technical constraints and in in theory, but in practice I feel like it didn't hold up well enough around that mm -hmm. to for it to pay off like as a, again I'll cite Wind Waker again which is still a beautiful game all these years on because it was a smartly tightly designed art direction right right but I mean at the time you know we hated it because Zelda come on Zelda Cameron <laughs> I didn't hate it but then I wasn't much of a Zelda fan at that point I or, uh, or ever. <laughs> I, I shamefully was one of the ones who, you know, I really got into Ocarina of Time. Um, not as much as I got into um, Banjo-Kazooie, you know, but... And, and I was kind of hurt as a Banjo-Kazooie fan that everybody moved on to Ocarina of Time and forgot about poor Banjo-Kazooie. Uh, but um, <laughs> I, I, I still, you know, loved the hell out of Ocarina of Time and uh, Majora's Mask to a lesser extent. And... Um, I was really excited to see what they were going to do on the GameCube, you know, as a follow-up. And Wind Waker just seemed like, visually, it just seemed like they were retreating in this weird direction that wasn't what anybody wanted. And it, I, it's a shame because it, and yeah, it's a great game and it, it was a great art style. Bring, but it's funny we bring up this comparison because it also just dawned on me that both uh, Mario Kart Double Dash and Zelda sort of got these misleading like GameCube promos that made yeah. you think the aesthetic get of the game was going to be different than it was. Uh, Zelda got that like the uh, awesome uh, Ganondorf and Link fight. Yeah. And then uh, uh, I think it was just Mario Kart for GameCube at this point, but they had uh, 
I think it was just Mario and Luigi in their Super Smash Brothers Melee models, like, driving around in probably the cart from Melee as well, just as, like, a quick and dirty little it's coming, shut up about it teaser. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it kind of misled me on what to expect from the aesthetic of that game going forward. Yeah, which I don't know why anybody puts any stock in those uh, those little teaser things that Nintendo does because they've never panned out to be anything worth uh, believing in. But um, <laughs> I mean, we, I mean, we, even Rare had some in at the dawn of the GameCube era. Not, I'm not even talking about Donkey Kong Racing. I'm talking about oh, uh, the Banjo yeah, Banjo one, like that one where they just like plugged hundreds of characters into the rock solid bar to show that they could. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we threw that on our Banjo 3E page on uh, DK Vine. It, 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 it gave us an excuse to have a Banjo 3E page, so uh, I stand by that decision. <laughs> so anyway, um, besides the, the aesthetical things about Mario Kart 64, let's talk a little bit about the gameplay, because one of the things that needs to be brought up... It, it's, and this is going to be compared to Diddy Kong Racing. It's something I didn't notice until Diddy Kong Racing was a thing. But the uh, the AI and um, how it, in actuality, uh, is, is programmed to be a cheating bastard. And um, <laughs> th I, I, I assume this was the case with Super Mario Kart, but I didn't notice it because, again, I was a dumb kid. And it wasn't something... It's something that I suspected for the more I played Mario Kart 64 because characters seem to be able to catch up to you implausibly. But, you know, it's something that you couldn't quite put your finger on it because you didn't have any evidence. But, yeah. But it's the, you. Eventually you spot the thread and kind of figure out what's going on. Well, and it was, and did it again, Diddy Kong Racing, you play it and you can get far ahead of characters and they will never catch up to you. There And... That's when it became manifest. Oh my God, Mario Kart 64. The the AI is not realistic. It, it's designed to be perpetually competitive. Right, and honest, it's kind of weird because of... Like, in the time that I was playing these games, when I was still young and pretty shit at both of them, still kind of am, um, I remember... Getting fairly far in Mario Kart 64, like maybe even completing it at the time, and then moving on to Diddy Kong Racing and losing horribly within like the first few tracks, and thinking to myself, oh my god, this is so much harder than Mario Kart 64. <laughs> what I what I realized later on is that Diddy Kong Racing is kind of laid out where there isn't as much rubber banding and the difficulty of the other racers scales as you get to the harder tracks. Mario Kart 64, what I had realized is because I was a kid who was driving absurdly poorly, I'd end up in the middle of the pack constantly in races. And how I think it ends up working is that if you're in the middle of the pack, like Mario Kart 64 is... The AI is concentrated on making sure somebody is always gunning for you at every single time. Every mm -hmm. second of the gameplay is this neck-and-neck -neck battle. Yeah. So when you're constantly in the middle of the pack, you get one good item, and you can shoot off to first and maintain it until you have to fend somebody off. Right. And I think that gave me the false impression that it was a much easier game at the time. And now when I replay it and I actually... Like, just this weekend, now that I sort of know what I'm doing, I'm catching that even on the, like, very low difficulties of Mario Kart 64, you'll hit an enemy with an item that should have sent them, like, ir irrecoverably toward the back of the pack, and they will be right next to you about five seconds later. <laughs> yeah, and... I understand why they do it. I mean, Mario Kart 64 is, supposed to, is designed to be a game that... Um, you know, a novice can pick up, and you know, it, you 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 want to keep it fair and balanced, even when in single player, I guess. So, you know, it, it, it's you you can compare the Mario Kart method to the Diddy Kong Racing method, but 
and obviously I prefer the Diddy Kong racing method. I don't like rubber banding AI, but let's be honest. I played Mario Kart 64 to completion with Donkey Kong beat, you know, every, got every cup, got gold on every cup and, uh, had a great time. It, it's not something that really ruined the game for me. And it's only yeah, me, at me either. Um, it's, I also don't think this is a particularly like, again, pissing contest kind of moment because almost every diehard fan who loves Mario Kart 64 to death will tell you, yeah, the AI is severely rubber banded. Yeah, and now, I don't think it's as bad in Mario Kart 64, though, as it is in its uh, follow-ups. Mario Mario Kart Double Dash, Mario Kart DS, and Mario Kart Wii are especially... They I, seem to be especially bad when it comes to I, rubber band. I kind of have a theory on that, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts, or... Sure. Honestly, anybody listening to this, if you know anything about AI, please explain... But I kind of feel like the the cheating in Mario Kart 64 by the computer is more apparent than other games insofar as them being able to catch up to you really fast. In Mario Kart 64, like just recently playing it, I didn't find myself getting bombarded by enemy items that much. Mm -hmm. In future Mario Kart games where the actual computer AI feels a little bit more balanced, I'm getting bombarded by unavoidable items constantly. And I think that may be one reason that it doesn't, it still feels like the rubber banding is there, but it doesn't feel like it's as much on the driver AI. And I would prefer it if it was on the driver AI, like it is in Mario Kart 64. Uh, <laughs> because in, I infamously in the DK Vine community played, um, Mario Kart Double Dash as a, a slush fund feature, my first. And because it's a game that kind of broke me when it first came out, and I just put it down and I never touched it again. And I, I had I went back with Donkey and Diddy and said, Okay, I'm going to beat this game now with the Kongs and it was one of the most grueling gaming experiences of my life because you are being bombarded non-stop with the, the winged spiny shells, with the uh, lightning bolts, with, with things you can't avoid. And and the bad thing about that game is, like, the, the spiny shell will stop you dead in your tracks. There's, like, a, an explosion, and you fly up into the air, and you can't do anything about it. And, Where of course, it... in your case, it's made even more worse because you're playing as Donkey Kong, who, <laughs> in his... Uh, in his particular vehicle has a horrifically slow acceleration rate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a purist, I'm a loyalist, but it, it did make the situation a little bit worse. <laughs> a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I think the item imbalance in the later Mario Kart games, which I should be pointing out, I think has been mostly rectified in Mario Kart 8. I didn't find myself flying into uncontrollable rages as much in Mario Kart 8. It definitely seemed more balanced, whatever they did. I, I need to go back and really study the AI in that game I to kind of suss it out a little bit. But, um... The, they, um they stripped the wings off the off the spiny shell. That's, that's probably that's a, good a good start. start. That's a good start, but I feel like they, they did remove the obvious rubber banding of the AI in those sequels, but the item in balance then was just off the charts and it made the games nearly unplayable in single player especially on the higher difficulties where it, it's just not fun because it's just this this haltingness to it all where oh you're you're racing along at a good clip yeah you're leading boom item you get hit by an item right before you cross the finish line and there's nothing you can do yeah. it just, there, there's and an unfairness to it that isn't really there in mario kart 64 because you if you drive well and you have enough strategy, you can stay ahead in this game. And it, while it's going to be like, white knuckle, neck and neck for a large part of it, it's still something you can outmaneuver with enough uh, gameplay skill and experience. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, this wasn't really 
clear to me until Diddy Kong Racing came out. So I can't really hold it against the game because if it wasn't for this other kart racer coming out later this year, I, I would never really have an issue with it. Um, so yeah, the AI cheats, but it's not the deal breaker is in later Mario Kart games. I, I think it's kind of a a testament to how annoying the uh, the items are in later Mario Kart games because I had this I had this sort of like nitpicky thing sort of like how DK Vine ha historically has with hero coins when they're called DK coins <laughs> um, where the sort of meme surrounding the the spiny shell was that it was the fucking blue shell fucking yeah. blue shells goddamn blue shells and all this time because I grew up with Mario Kart 64 I'm thinking it it's called the spiny shell and, and it, it's actually kind of violet and, <laughs> and, but after a while like when they when they introduced the winged one and I just got like beat by this thing over and over again I'm like y you know what fucking blue shells rolls off the tongue a lot better yeah yeah <laughs> Well, and the thing about the uh, the spiny shell in Mario Kart 64 is you can beat it. it you if you have if you have the uh, the trail of uh, bananas or you have a green or red shell hanging behind your cart, it can collide into that right and and not and, affect you. And, and mind that's if the person who fires it doesn't like immediately misfire it into a wall because yes, that that was also kind of an issue Mario Kart 64 had with. Uh, red shells and the spiny shell, any kind of item that was supposed to track the behavior of another driver because there was always, depending on where you fired it, a chance that it would just like immediately veer off to the left and clunk against a wall. Right. <laughs> Which, again, was a good equalizer, too. I mean, it, it, they weren't foolproof where Double Dash put fucking wings on the shell and <laughs> it, it flew above the track and then like landed on you and there is no way to avoid it and uh <sighs> there's also something else i i kind of picked up on this when i was a kid too and it it threw me off when double dash came around which is the item i don't think the items in mario kart 64 adjust in probability as much depending on what place you're in because i would remember say situations where i'd be in second place and Get a get the star power up or the lightning bolt, you, you or could... the spiny shell in Mario Kart sixty four. Mm -hmm. In later Mario Karts, you like blatantly can't do that. You could get those items um, in in those places. They would just be much 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 rarer. But it was possible. Uh, I think Nintendo Power put out a chart that showed the likelihood of getting an item depending on what place you were in. And you could get, like, a star in second place. Or, you know, it just wasn't going to be a surefire, surefire guarantee. And then, of course, they did remove it completely right. in later Mario Kart games where it would be impossible to get yeah, the, uh, the I, I higher grade Yeah, I specifically item. remember looking at, like, a double dash version of that chart where essentially it was first place, uh, you, you, you get bananas... You, you might get a big item box. Oh, um, just nothing exciting in first place. Right, and you couldn't even use those as shields in that game from the, the winged spiny shell, so... Oh, that fucking... Okay, we're, we're in, I'm not going to get hung up on that winged spiny shell, because it's not in this game. It's not in this yeah. game. Yeah, Mario Kart Mario 64, 64 is, is a nice, safe place. A, ha a happy game. So I, I I would be derelict in duty to not point out that um, as a kid I had to come up with a fan and story for Mario Kart 64 because I needed to explain why Donkey Kong's world could be uh, interacting with Mario's world. And this was before we came up with the explanation. Uh, thanks to Mario Party of a warp pipe connecting Donkey Kong Island to the Mushroom Kingdom. Uh, it takes it to Mushroom Village in actuality, but... I came up with this elaborate story about uh, there being a dimensional breach between the two, the two realms. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I it, 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 it let me sleep at night. But um, See, I just always assumed it was a warp pipe because I grew up on a VHS tape of the Super Show where they yeah. did the warp pipe to real world thing constantly. Thankfully, Mario Party, the, the next game to cross over Donkey Kong with Mario... 
Uh, oddly enough, it, it took two years for there to be a, a, any sort of follow-up. But, uh, yeah, Mario Party in 1999 firmly established a war pipe in Mushroom Village that goes directly to the Congo jungle. And oh, I, that, that, that was a, like a life preserver. Um, and then <laughs> Super some... Smash Brothers had the chest of time, which... <laughs> uh, is something, something I do remember enjoying about reading the the write-ups from that era in the site's history is that whenever the history of a game had to be recounted where you could play as a character other than Donkey Kong, like Mario or Wario or Link or Fox, the, the, the DK Vine canon story would always be that Donkey Kong won. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and then, of course, when Diddy became a playable character... We had to keep it more nebulous because uh, one of them won. Maybe, maybe Donkey Kong won some, maybe Diddy Kong won some. But, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> In my personal canon, the Kongs always win, which uh, uh, I, I like to imagine when uh, Diddy finally joined it and then later, you know, Funky or Dixie, depending on the game, um, took the pressure off Donkey Kong. He didn't always have to win. Um, of course, Donkey Kong. I got. I have to look at it, but Donkey Kong or Diddy have probably won the most Olympic gold medals in history, <laughs> uh, in the most wide variety of sports too. So maybe, uh, maybe this is why he had to stop being playable in Mario Party. He he just became that guy on game night, who <laughs> who you couldn't let you couldn't let him at the trivia table because he would school everyone. And it would just be a miserable time, so they just had to one day give him a case of beer and make him sit off to the side. Yeah, it, it was my personal uh, fanon that when Mario Party 5 rolled around, because Mario Party 5 came out, I think, a week before Double Dash, or if, if not a week, then very, very close to Double Dash. And so Mario or Donkey Kong was preparing for this big Mario Kart race, and then all of a sudden these, uh, these star sprites or whatever in the dream realm like beam them all there and said hey you guys have to play mario party and donkey kong had like a nervous breakdown and said i can't <laughs> do this anymore I'll, I'll 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 like just be uh this third party on the game board but i've already schooled you clowns four times in mario party i'm not going to do this anymore when i'm preparing for a major mario kart competition so uh was, and he was still playable in the driving mini game in that game, so it still works. So yeah, he was he was just praying. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about our favorite tracks in the game, and we're not going to talk about all of them because uh, I really don't have much to say about Luigi Raceway, for example. Um, yeah. Um, I think the only thing I have to say that I remember about Luigi's raceway was uh learning about the the copyright infringing ads that had to be changed when they translated the game to into english oh yeah yeah i think this was like on the the mushroom kingdom site or something they did like an inventory of the various like raceway ads on the side of tracks and how they they were original a lot of them were originally parodies of like famous North American companies that you'd see in in NASCAR racing or Formula One. It'd be Formula One because yeah, Formula One's actually a thing in Japan, and I mean that's what F Zero is based off of. I mean, right? Like a uh, like for instance, uh, uh, like one of the ad that's Mario Star in the U.S. version. It was originally it for Mario Row. And the the logo for that looks like the Marlboro cigarettes logo. <laughs> <laughs> hey kids, smoke them if you got them. <laughs> now, uh, the thing that bugs me about the uh, the signs on Mario Kart tracks this this is a weird tangent, but it implies that these characters all have numerous businesses that they operate in their spare time, like. I like Luigi's is just this generic sign that appears on Luigi Raceway. Is that like, does he have an Italian restaurant in a mushroom? Like, I, I could see him having an Italian restaurant in a mushroom kingdom, but 
When does he have the time to own and operate this? I don't, I don't know. I'm like, I'm curious about uh, the burning DK and energy drink from Mario Kart Eight. See, for for <laughs> just, <laughs> I mean, is that a pun on anything, or is that just this weird like Japan Japanese to English I, thing? I, I don't know. Is it a, is it a joke about like how Red Bull destroys your insides? Because that's what it kind of sounds like. Yeah, I don't I don't know, <laughs> but I see. I can see Donkey Kong like sponsoring an energy drink. At, at that point in the canon because yeah donkey kong's a big enough celebrity in the mushroom kingdom and in the rare archipelago that yeah he would sponsor an energy drink he does like lend his likeness to an energy drink sure i could see that but at this point in time and, and it's interesting to point out donkey kong has no businesses in mario kart 64 there is nothing attached to his name and actually like quite a few it, it might be... Is Mario Kart 8 the first time Donkey Kong has a business associated with himself? That's a good question. I don't really know. I know that... I mean, obviously, in his own course in Double Dash, he had a sign, but that's not really an ad. That was just a bit of directional sign. Yeah. Um, and he did have that ski resort with his name on it in Mario Kart Wii. So, yeah, I don't really know. Yeah, I've got, I think Burning DK is is the first like blatant product that uh, he's associated with in these games. So I, I just I just assume that it's a either a Mushroom Kingdom energy drink company or a Rare Archipelago uh, energy drink uh, company. But um, anyway, um, it, it well, bugs yeah, we, me. Yeah. But... Let's move on from Luigi's Raceway. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 it just bothers me, too, that they changed them from game to game. Like, oh, it would be one thing if, like, Luigi's was just a sign they frequently use. Because, yeah, it's his Italian restaurant. But the fact that they all get, like, different businesses in each Mario Kart game. It's either they're, they're terrible business people <laughs> who go through a multitude of businesses that just fail you know, every few years. <laughs> I like or, the idea that, like, the Mario cast is just corporate tie-in poison. That all these companies <laughs> make sponsorship deals with them. And then, because of having to pay off all the cart damages from blue shells and bananas and other miscellaneous things, they just they go under the year later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> by, the, by, by the way, I'm, you brought up the cart. Can I just say that the cart designs in Mario Kart 64 and Super Circuit are my favorite? I love the simplicity of them. Um, I, I don't really like that later Mario Kart games brought in a multitude of vehicles to choose from because then it became less about the characters you choose and more just what vehicles you stick them in. Um, I, I like just the uniform. We all have the same cart, just different colors. And um, I, th I think then uh, Mario Kart 8 or 7 or something uh, retcon these as being called the bolt buggies or something uh, i don't know but i know that like uh i think uh mario kart 7 and 8 brought back the the basic kind of model of these carts and yeah i mean i have to say if you asked me like describe what a go-kart looks like i this is the go-kart i would describe absolutely draw. and i say that as a diddy kong racing loyalist Th this is the definitive go-kart so all right, let's uh, let, let's talk about some of our favorite tracks. Uh, well, actually, let me talk about Luigi Raceway uh, for another twenty minutes or so. I like the hot air balloon that comes down that you can never get the item block or you can never time it just right. I think I got it maybe like twice in my entire career playing Mario Kart, and it was a spiny shell. It was always a spiny shell. Um, no, I'm, I'm I'm done talking about that. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the battle mode real quick, because I feel like this is essential to the multiplayer experience of Mario Kart, uh, but it never comes up if you're you're mostly in it for the single player. But for me, the, the out of the four battle mode, and battle mode was a big deal in this game, because this is the game that introduced battle mode, and it was before GoldenEye, there was battle mode. I mean, this is, this is what people played... They're in 64 is for uh, just in premise of... you you like the idea of being able to fight your friends in the vehicle I mean, that's 
That's the whole premise of Twisted Metal. That's why that worked. And normally, I don't like competitive multiplayer because I like multiplayer where you're all teaming up to accomplish something. Uh, the two-player team in Donkey Kong Country is, is my famous go-to example. That's why Sea of Thieves is one of the most fun gaming experiences I've ever had. Because it's four people, uh, at least four people coming together um, to form a crew and all accomplish the same goal. It's, it's magnificent. But um, I love Battle Mode in Mario Kart 64. But let's be honest, Battle Mode really means one course in particular above all others and that's block fort block fort uh no, no offense to the donut or the sky skyscraper or the the double deck whatever i mean they're we we, we played them and they were amusing diversions but 80 percent of the time you would play battle mode for block fort and there has never been a mario kart battle course like block fort since then i mean double dashes I, I i hate to keep bringing up double dash i thought this episode would be a series of unfortunate comparisons between mario kart 64 and diddy kong racing but it's turning out to be us just talking shit about double dash and i don't, <laughs> don't want to do that either but one of the big failings of double dash was it had a limp battle mode and it could have they could have prevented that by just porting over block fort because block I'm fort is... I'm thinking in particular, are you thinking of Block City from Double Dash? What like, was Bl that? That was yeah. garbage. <laughs> yeah, you and me had the exact same reaction. Um, I remember I took Double Dash over to a friend's house, and we were all super excited to try out the new battle mode. And we had seen Block City and thought, oh man, this is going to be just like Block Fort. And uh, it was just a sort of... It had the lo it was like playing the lower tier of block fort and nothing else. The the structures in all four corners were just decorative. Yeah. <laughs> what what block fort was was golden eye before golden eye. And part of me is convinced rare developed the uh, the multiplayer in golden eye because of how fun block fort was. And I was like, well, what if we did that with James Bond characters and guns? Um, there's so much strategy that's possible in block fort so much sheer panic that can set in so much exploration to be had it, it, it is pure joy and i don't know how how or why they've never been able to replicate this feeling in mario kart's battle mode when, when just, people just, just put block fort in every single mario yeah. kart battle mode from now on when, when, it, i will not complain when people um wax poetically about how great battle mode is in Mario Kart. They are talking about block fort and nothing else. I mean, yeah, the, yeah, the donut stage can kind of be fun, but it's just mostly hit and run. You know, it's mostly, it, Oh, it's, we're driving towards each other. Attack. Sky, skyscraper is fun, but for the wrong reason. And that's because everybody constantly drives off the side by accident. <laughs> I remember having arguments with Elliot about whether skyscraper was big ape city or not. <laughs> um, now, now it's going to be New Donk City that people are going to have arguments about. But, um, so, um, yeah, I mean, Block 4, I, 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 I am not a competitive multiplayer kind of guy, but Block 4, I made an exception for, and I still have so much warm fuzzies for that, that fucking, uh, stage. I, I tried to nail down why I think it is that I like that stage, and not just because... It's got a Lego kind of aesthetic, and everything is inherently more fun with Lego. I think it has to do with... It's a very big arena, but because everything is color-coded, you also know where everybody is at any given moment. Yeah, and yeah. That is true, because yeah, you're not playing online, so you, you have a split screen. So um, there is you are able to look at the other player's position. Um, yeah. The, the, the color coding is actually, yeah, quite, quite brilliant. And what, what I like doing was getting to the top of uh, a particular uh, quadrant of the block fort and kind of holding it down as my domain and fending off any attackers. That was a lot of fun. And of course, I was always Donkey Kong, you know. But um, some some of the joy too is losing then and becoming that that bomb cart, 
and uh, then you're just an agent of chaos. That and was such a that's such a clever idea to compromise and give one of the losing players something to do. Yeah, because you're not just yeah, sitting there. Yeah, yeah, you've lost, but you can still be a vindictive asshole. Everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's how we got to the state of our modern day politics. Um, all right, let's move on to some of the actual race courses, and these are going to be some of our favorite. We both uh independently chose some of our favorites some of these are our favorites some of these are just noteworthy tracks we would be um at fault if we didn't bring up and um apologies if your favorite track is not mentioned but yeah i don't care <laughs> uh let's start with moo moo farm which um i don't know um Moo Moo Farm just kind of sticks out for me because it it's one of those that's grounded but still very surreal. It's it's I mean it's 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 a it's a sprawling countryside farm. This but is kind it, of a common theme in Mario Kart 64, and I'll get to it later. Okay, just, like what what the the realism, just the, but just s- sort of skewed realism skewed into the the silliness of a kart race. Yeah, well, the thing I like about things like Moo Moo Farm is this is not a Mario stage. It's not just turning a Mario level into a a racetrack like Super Mario Kart mostly did. This is taking a completely non-related kind of environment or terrain and making it Marioized. It's making it like part of the Mushroom Kingdom. So, even if it's just uh, funky-looking cows and Monty Moles jumping out of the ground, it's still... It, it works. It, it's, it's, it, it grounds it in kind of something you can comprehend. But, again, it, it makes it dreamlike. That, that's, that's the where Mario Kart, I think, ex, 64 excels in its design. It's taking the mundane and making it like a weird, yeah, uh, weird it's, dream. That's something I lo- like with fantasy worlds in general like like this is this is a normal cow farm through the lens of mario it's the same kind of reason i like things like going through a level in a banjo game and suddenly finding a public toilet (laughs) like just just seeing something mundane and logical exist in this colorful fantasy world and seeing what they do with it why mario kart 8 was such a breath of fresh air after the the games between uh super circuit and um and well it uh, mario kart 8 because you had the mushroom kingdom as a living breathing world i think for the first time in in a game like this it's it's the kind of game i expected to see of the mario series when i was a kid and knowing that games were only going to get more advanced as time moved on i expected to see a more fleshed out realistic mushroom kingdom versus doubling down on kind of nonsense that actually transpired so things like seeing uh an airport in the mushroom kingdom brilliant i mean that that's why one of the reasons i love mario kart 8 and i think it's the finest mario kart game since mario kart 64 but oh absolutely uh, yeah moo moo farm Uh, incidentally i think we'd be remiss not to mention that moo moo farm inspired moo moo meadows in mario kart wii which then came back in mario kart 8 and both the the uh Moo Moo Cows and Moo Moo Meadows kind of became this mascot of all of our uh, DK Vine Mario Kart 8 racing sessions. Yeah, when Mario because Kart I think we all just out. we all just looked at the like a, adorable silly little cow on the icon and we kept picking that track over and over. Yeah, when Mario Kart 8 came out, we we would have many like DK Vine staff just jam sessions on it and um yeah, for some reason that became our our favorite track. And uh, Cuburn in the the live stream chat, uh, available to patrons of the five dollar and up tier, listen to the conversation live. Find out more details at dkvine.com slash Patreon. Cuburn says that the cows in Moo Moo Farm are the cutest things in the entire Mario series. And you know what? I think I agree. They're, I, I, I I don't know. They're 
they're almost um, rare like in design. I mean, but with that Mario um, bent to them, it's not because rare would just give them ghastly googly eyes and that would be the joke. <laughs> but uh, there, there's a, I mean, I'm not knocking rare's design process because they have a method to their madness that really works for me, works for me. But um, yeah, I, normally like the Mario characters don't appeal to me as much, but something about those cows, man, gets me right in the heart. Um, I also love the music in Moomoo Farm, too. Um, and it should be pointed out that the music in Mario Kart 64 is just fantastic. This is the one with a lot of, like, synth fiddle in it, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess it is. Maybe the synth uh, elements also add to the kind of otherworldly quality to it um, that, that I keep coming back to. I don't know. Uh, Koopa Troopa Beach. This is um, one of those tracks that... Uh, is mostly notable for the myriad of shortcuts you can find yourself in. Um, and um, this is this is where Mario Kart 64 really set up itself apart from its predecessor by it being a polygonal world that was fully 3D. You could have interesting shortcuts that go beyond just hopping over shit with your feather. And um, oh, on the flip side of that, it made the cheating AI very easy to spot when, <laughs> by all logic, you should have a comfortable lead. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, I mean, this is this is I think the the most famous one here is uh, jumping behind the, the was it a waterfall or you go through the uh, the, the cave and you yeah, you have to go off a ramp into a cave and you come out behind the waterfall. Yeah. Uh, and it should be pointed out, you know, Mario Kart 64 is a game that's celebrated for shortcuts, but there are also a lot of shortcuts that the uh, developers didn't necessarily anticipate that you can exploit. And um, one of the reasons I prefer this Mario Kart game, even even to you know Mario Kart 8, you know, as for as much as it did to rectify the mistakes of the series, one of the areas I feel like it didn't do justice for was letting you go off track as much and explore and, yeah. and find shortcuts. It, it, it still feels too confined to what the game tells you. No, this, yeah. this is where you need to be. There are a lot more railings and automatic Lakitu resets in future Mario Kart games than there are in Mario Kart 64. I like the possibilities of this game. It's, yeah, a lot of it, too, is breaking the game, finding areas where you could clip through and have Lakitu reset you at places you're not supposed to be. But, you know, I like it. I like that there was always some strategy, and we'll get into some of those in some of the later tracks oh, yeah. we discuss. But Koopa Troopa Beach actually just had institutional shortcuts that really stick out in my mind as just some of the most memorable of the series because it was kind of the first time you you had that um as an option and you it kind of was 10 lines it was like oh wait what, what's that up there it made exploration part of mario kart beyond just purely racing and um that was an important stepping stone as we got to diddy kong racing later in the year where you had to explore to find things like silver coins and keys and just weird easter eggs where it would put in so all right uh calamari desert um, it's a really clever pun, but I never understood why it was a pun, because it's not like they had any sort of uh, squid-like theme to this desert. It was just a desert. I feel really bad that they can't use this name for the Splatoon track in Mario Kart now. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Uh, they could always retcon it as being a, a like some sort of home course, but I don't think they would do that. Um, yeah, well, this I know is... what I love about this track, but what do you like about it, Hyle? Um, well, I again, this is this is something that they kind of nerfed in this track when they would bring it back. But um, I like that you could um, drive through the tunnel. The, uh, the the same exact thing. Yes, um, we got into this with Koopa Troopa Beach, but Mario Kart sixty four lets you go off the beaten path a lot, even though it's against all logic. There's absolutely no reason you should. There, there, there's no reason you should be able to go into that train tunnel. But it lets you do it anyway. Well, because it's a terrifying gambit. I mean, <laughs> you're like, is the train going to come or not? And I, I think there's a way to cheat the system. Isn't it like you use a star when going through the tunnel and you can, like, trick trick the game into, um, like, bypassing, like, a lap or something? I, I don't know. There's something to it. And 
it's that that kind of more sandbox elements to Mario Kart 64 that again you, even a game like 8 is lacking and they brought back Calamari Desert in Mario Kart 8 but you couldn't you couldn't go through the tunnel like you could here and um, it's a shame because just... um, it's it's just the joy of having and keep in mind this was the first game you could control Donkey Kong in a fully 3D environment so for me up until Donkey Kong 64 came out, this was my 3D Donkey Kong platformer. So, you know, yeah, I, I was interested in the racing, but fire up time trial mode and just dick around as Donkey Kong and explore these tracks as much as Lakitu would let you. And, you know, you could kind of convince yourself you were in a 3D Donkey Kong game for just that brief little moment in time. And, yeah, and I don't do this as much anymore, but I know I did it constantly with old racing games at the time is I'd deliberately load up a mode and say, you know what, I'm not going to race. I'm just going to fuck around the track a little bit and see what I can get into and what they'll let me get away with. Yeah, honestly, that's what I use time trial mode for in this game. I, I didn't care about like setting lap times or having the best ghost. Oh, it should be pointing out to the ghost mode in this game because it's the game that introduced ghost mode, but y the only way to save your ghost was if you had the... Um, the controller pack, which never made any sense to me. Was the memory that high that it couldn't be maintained on your own, like, cart? I, I understood the principle, oh, you're supposed to take it to your friends. Uh, well, Mark, didn't uh, Diddy Kong Racing have the same constraint, too? Like, there just isn't enough... There isn't enough space on the cart to save it? I don't know. I feel like it did, because I remember saving to the controller pack on Diddy Kong Racing. Okay. Because I remember you had to beat um, the TT Ghost. W didn't, like... Oh, that that didn't matter. Um, yeah. It was it was to save your own ghost. Right, You could right, still right. beat TT to your heart's content. I, I just don't remember at this point in time if when you beat TT, if he was replaced by your own ghost or if it was always TT's ghost. I think it may have... Again, my memory is failing, and I apologize if I get this wrong. I feel like it held your ghost data as long as the game was still on. Okay. Yeah, and you I, were still I, in those modes, like just to just so you could try to ra race TT, fail, and then try again and see what you did wrong. I promise this is something we're gonna figure out by November when we do our Diddy Kong Racing Spotlight. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I. Uh, it, it, I guess it was fine at the time, but the annoying part is every time Mario Kart 64 then is available on the virtual console, you still can't save your ghosts, and there is no way to save them because you don't have an N64 controller pack for the Wii U. So I, I wish there was a way they could sort that out at long last. But I'm almost certain there is, and they just aren't going to. Because <laughs> they're lazy. <laughs> they're totally, they don't. They they don't put any manpower in their virtual console releases it's why it was so shocking when they released earthbound zero uh the original mother game uh a couple years ago was... i mean to be fair that was already translated too they were sitting on the rom for it i think they i can't even remember if they changed the title screen or not oh okay because <laughs> yeah it, it was the original translation that they did back in what was it like 1990 and then ended up getting leaked on the internet when they didn't release it. Right, okay. So weird. Nintendo, you're a weird bunch of... Alright. So, um... Yeah, Calamari Desert. And again, this is just a, a desert. It's an it's American Southwest desert. Um, it even which... has the, uh... It even has the good, bad, and the ugly sting in the music. Yeah, it does! Um... It's funny, though, that they went with the Calamari Desert, because you'd think this would be an African desert, a North African kind of uh, environment, but no, they went with the American Southwest Desert. You'd think they should have saved Calamari Desert as a pun they could have worked in in the later game and gone with something else entirely. Whatever. Um, all right, let's, let's move on to the Flower Cup and Toad's Turnpike. This stage uh, <laughs> was... This is this is mind blowing. This is like one of those stages that seemed like a big fucking deal at the time, and it was a big fucking it, deal. It, it was a game. It was a stage, a, a track that was essentially not a track. It was 
you're driving on a busy freeway and it's, it's one of those you saw screenshots of it before the game came out and you were like no way that's actually they're actually going to do that because it's it's like something you would have an idea for as a kid like it's, oh wouldn't it be funny if they're you know in a racing game you just or in the original super mario kart if you just drove through traffic and it's one that- of those things uh I love this track because I think it's just conceptually hilarious that how, again, in part owing to the more sort of realistic aesthetic of this game, it's very clear in this level how much of a bad idea this is. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> it makes you wonder about the Mario Kart, like, I don't know, the the, the committees that plan this, you know, like... How does this get signed off on? How does everybody like sign away their life rights to do this? Like, like this, this is clearly illegal street like, racing, or, or at best, like the Mushroom Kingdom's answer to Jackass or something. Yeah, it's... yeah. Well, like, yeah. How how is this? How do any lawyers sign off on? I guess the lawyers were like frothing at the mouth because of all the, uh, the lawsuits they could bring about. But you know. It's it's and I could see like char- the characters going along with this, especially like Donkey Kong, because this was at the height of you know '90s extreme, the X Games and whatnot. Of course, he'd be all for this, swigging his Mountain Dew and uh, <laughs> going all in. It, it's probably fitting that it's Toad's Turnpike too, because Toad's voice in this game is kind of maniacal. <laughs> A little bit, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> um. I, I need to also point out a, a personal belief I had for the longest time up until they brought back Toad's Turnpike in one of the newer games. I, I, I argued until I was blue in the face that Toad's Toad, Turds Turnpike <laughs> <laughs> maybe in Conquer Racing. Toad's it, Turnpike um, We'll bookmark that for when the minecart ride turns out to be a Captain Toad ride. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Toad's Turnpike I argue that it didn't take place in the Mushroom Kingdom, that it took place in Japan. All based on Japanese uh, characters appearing on one of the license plates in this uh, stage. I think the school bus. They uh, they didn't uh, swatch, switch it out in the localization. And so I, I said, nope, this takes place in Japan then. This this is what, what, what they did, what the Mario characters did was, it was like early morning Japan before the sun was even fully up and they just took over this turnpike and raced on it and the Japanese authorities couldn't get there in time to stop them. See, I think I, I think part of me thought it was Brooklyn just because I was still immersed in that early 90s Mario continuity where everything was nebulous. I'm still immersed in that Cameron. I still find a way to work in Brooklyn whenever possible. Um, I, I, f- I found a way to reconcile Yoshi's Island with the Brooklyn origin simply by saying, you know, though Mario and Luigi, they were born in the Mushroom Kingdom, but then after the events of Yoshi's Island, uh, their birth parents hid them in Brooklyn from the forces of uh, Bowser. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that, that, that's my personal take on it. But Yeah, that's more or less what I settled on, too. Yeah. Um, but the... Obviously, the the logistical fallacy of having it be in Japan or Brooklyn is that then they would have to also find time to put that toad uh, etching in the uh, the overpass or whatever that was. So, um, I, I and I think Mario Kart Eight finally dispels the notion that it could be anywhere but the Mushroom Kingdom. Sadly enough, so. But it does still keep like the sort of it doesn't go all the way out to destroy the aesthetic of the original and i i do like the reinterpreted take on in mario kart 8 yeah yeah although i i I still prefer the mario kart 64 version because it did have that kind of dreamy like is is i again with the dream uh references but was it like early dawn like because it was was just that it wasn't like like that kind of orange and purple sky like the kind you'd later see in uh, star city and diddy kong racing i think yeah yeah i i don't know i I, I love Toad's Turnpike. Um, and granted, this was uh, a frustrating at times because, yeah, you did run into the vehicles, but, uh, and of course... And it was hilarious you... when you did. <laughs> yes, yes. 
and uh, in mirror mode, the vehicles would actually be driving towards you, which gave it a, an extra degree of terror. <laughs> Again, staggeringly bad idea to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I'm surprised nobody in Nintendo vetoed this. Just be, you know, given how like, overly isn't this going to make kids want to play in yes. traffic? Like you know, because we had you know Power Wheel. I didn't have, didn't have Power Wheels. I remember Elliot had a, a Power Wheel when he you know he, he outgrew it by the time I met him. But um, as a you know toddler, he had a Power Wheel, and I was always envious of that bastard because I always wanted a Power Wheel. Um, which, for those of you who, who aren't aware, Power Wheels were basically these um, motorized cars. I don't know how they work. Were they, like, electric-powered or what? They were pat- what? powered by a battery. Okay, okay. A battery um, that didn't take long to go out. I battery. would imagine I, not, but... I had one. It, you uh, did? You yeah. bastard! <laughs> oh, man. I still it's... see things like that, and I'm like, should I just buy it? Should I just buy it and ride around in it and just get I, it out of my system? I'd say no, because unfortunately, I remember this from having them. Th- there is a very small window in which a child fits that seat. <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> Part of me would just suck it up and just be like, all right, I'm just going to ride around. I'd probably tip it over, but... One, one thing for sure, when I eventually have children, I'm buying them a fucking power wheel it, just to live vicariously through them. It's it's funny because uh, I actually had uh, I had one power wheel car and uh, some another thing that somebody had junked, which was a power wheel car that had the floor torn out of it, so it functioned like a Flintstone car. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, Q Burn again in the chat wants wants to correct me. I said Earthbound Zero, but uh, I think the correct well, name, according to him, was Earthbound Beginnings. The the name it was Nintendo finally localized it with was Earthbound Beginnings, but like colloquial, colloquial, ugh, I can't talk today. Colloquial, be known on the internet as Earthbound Zero. Okay. To differentiate it from Earthbound, I think in like one of the initial dumps of the ROM of that game, like somebody hacked the title screen to say zero, even just to differentiate it for people. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I don't feel as bad now. I, cause you know, I'm getting older as I already it, established. Mario Kart 64 is 20 years old and I'm, I'm just making sure my memory is, is working right. So, okay. It, good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway, I, I'm shocked more kids than drive their power wheels into the street and die as a result of this. <laughs> Or that would have been Nintendo's fear, and I'm I'm just glad this got the green light. Uh, Chaco Mountain, uh, or is it supposed to be? Yeah, it's it's Chaco Mountain. Uh, this is uh, this is kind of a a descendant of the Super Mario Kart uh, Coco Mountain tracks, right? Yeah, I guess it's kind of like a in the same family as like all the Yoshi's Island inspired names, like. Vanilla Dome and well, right, yeah, because yeah. because one of the Super Mario Kart uh, tracks or a couple of them were directly inspired by the Yoshi's Island chocolate uh, tracks. It was a, uh, it was a, uh, was it Lake or uh... v- v- was it Vanilla Lake in in Super Mario Kart? Um, God, yeah, there was it was something I can't because there's so many food related puns in that game. There was uh, the the soda lake or soda, uh, God, I don't, I don't even remember. It was weird because it was purportedly dinosaur themed, but then they went on these weird like, oh, we're gonna name this after uh, desserts and uh, snacks. Or, or the secret world named after the words Funky Kong would say. A yeah, tu- yeah, the nineties. Uh, t- tubular and funky Chaco Island was Super Mario Kart's um, take on it. So, uh, yeah, I, I always just assumed this was uh, in Dinosaur World. Chaco Mountain was just uh, in Dinosaur World uh, on where the Super Mario uh, World location and um, yeah, that, I was fine with that. And I, I, was, I was also fine literally believing this is a mountain made out of chocolate. It, like, it's funny. I, um, it like it took a while to dawn on me that that was the intent of this mountain because when you think about it, this is probably the most surreal 
location in the game Bar Rainbow Road, mm -hmm. in that it's it's a mountain made of chocolate, but it's it's a very subdued execution of that idea. Well, you could easily just take it to be you know in name only, and it's actually just mud. I mean, if if you're looking at it from a less fantastical perspective, but I always interpret it. Yeah, you could as, you could name this Dirt Mountain, and I wouldn't think anything was amiss. It's... Yeah, Poo Mountain again if it was conquer racing. Um, but yeah, I, I I took it to be a literal mountain made out of chocolate, and I think that just made it a little bit more charming. And, I think this uh, is also the only mountain in the game that has a face. Yeah, and I always wondered if that was the intent, and after Double Dash, I was certain of it, but uh, it wasn't really quite clear if those were supposed to be eyes or if it was just uh, kind of a trick, a, an optical illusion, like me seeing a face in things where there is no face, that, you know, that whole phenomenon. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, when I think of uh, Chaco Mountain, I think of N64 fog effects, which... <laughs> Granted, um, you know, Super Mario Kart 64 didn't really indulge in. And it made sense to... here. You're you're up, you're up high where the air's thinner. Yeah, I mean, this wasn't like Turok where there was fog effects in every goddamn stage to hide the limitations of the system or the the limitations of the people developing the game. But yeah, it made sense here, and uh, this this is one of those uh, two where there is a subtle difference in the. Um, higher um higher speed uh ones so you know 50 cc you had railings on the side of the uh the track but then in the uh the higher modes you know up to 150 cc in mirror mode there would be no railings so you could fall over the edge and uh, that was made especially more deadly when you had the boulders falling um down so yeah, I don't know. Chaco Mountain is just one of those favorites. It's, it's one of those I always think of when I think of Mario Kart 64. And it's one, one of those that I think, again, the later Mario Kart games would have sullied by making it more more ridiculous than it needed to be. Just the subtle subtleness of having a chocolate mountain. and But not really going overboard with the wackiness of it. I mean, even Mario Kart Super Circuit would go overboard with the wackiness. You would have uh, che the... Cheese Land made me laugh. Che uh, I mean, Cheese I'm Land okay was quite cheese <laughs> Yeah, I am okay with Cheese Land too, especially because Cheese Land was the moon of the Mushroom World, and that's the they brought it back in Mario Kart Eight, but it, they didn't really um, make any note of that that it was supposed to be initially the moon. So, in my mind, it's still the moon. <laughs> Wario Stadium. This this is uh I think for pure like shenanigans and racing fun. This is the uh this is this is the track right here. I don't know. This was the staple of like any time I would play this game in local multiplayer. This would be one of the ones we had to go through. As opposed to online multiplayer. <laughs> uh yeah. This I is so. Yeah, yeah. I uh, but th yeah, th this is it. This is um, it's long. I mean, it is it is one not not as long as Rainbow Road, but one of the longest of the game, and just the bumps and it it was. Keep in it, mind, this is this is the first 3D Mario Kart game, and this is the where it really feels thrilling because you have these big like sweeping hills and um, bumps, and it, it it's a dirt bike track. Yeah, it, it's another case sort of in the vein of Toad's Turnpike, but not quite as ridiculous, in that you're driving on something that's clearly not meant for a go-kart, yeah. and it makes it more fun. Yes. Because this is this is something that would be more at home in, in an Excite Bike game. Right. And of course there's an Excite Bike track in Mario Kart 8. And I, I probably have to say, like, uh, again, me... I've, I've explained my limitations in knowledge of Donkey Kong at this time. This was the first game I had played that had Wario in it, and this combined with his, like, obnoxiously whiny voice and his, like, mustache twirling and, like, his... This course having his face plastered on everything, that this game made me immediately like Wario. Same here. 
I, I've said before, out of the whole Mario cast, Wario, and to a much lesser extent, Waluigi, they're the ones I actually like out of the Mario cast, like the core Mario cast that you always see. Like The character Mario himself does nothing for me, and as you go down the cast, I get more and more annoyed with them. But Wario, I actually like that guy. I have an action figure of Wario up with my Donkey Kong universe figures. Uh, as the sole representation of the cameo games because I love Wario and Mario Kart 64 is I think what made me a fan of him um, I, I, you know I had you know Wario Land Virtual Boy uh, I played Wario Land Super Mario Land 3 you know but Mario Kart 64 is what made me realize oh he's a fun he's a fun character yeah, I'm not the... oh I'm sorry go ahead I'm sorry I'm actually just finding this out now, looking looking up information about this track. Um, Wario Stadium, because I know that this is one of the few tracks that hasn't come back as a as a retro stage in any of the uh, any Mario Kart after it. And apparently, it's the only track from Mario Kart 64 that hasn't come back at all. Interesting. I w I wonder if it's because of the shortcut, or the the shortcut that they didn't um, anticipate. On. Um, Rather which, the, or the, yeah. op, the kind of opposite of a shortcut that is that ramp in the very center. Well, I mean, the um, I don't know if we're talking about the same thing here, but there there's the trick that you can do right at the beginning of the the, um, the track, where if you use a mushroom and hit the side of the wall just right, if you go to the left over the first hill, and you use a mushroom and you hit the wall just right, you'll bounce over the wall and and bypass really? the majority of the track. Yes. I and actually did not know about this. You you can beat Wario uh, Stadium in no time at all by this. And, I mean, it's, it's mostly useful in time trial when you have uh, three mushrooms. I think you don't even need to use a mushroom, maybe. But, yeah, it, it's one of the most notorious shortcuts, or was one of the most notorious shortcuts back in the day. And granted, they, they would have just eliminated the possibility of even doing that, you know, because I think it's it's unique to this game's physics. It's not something you could replicate in another Mario Kart game if you brought the track over and remade it. But, yeah, it's funny. Considering how beloved Wario Stadium is, you would think maybe there is a reason why they haven't brought it back. And they, they've had spiritual, you know, successors to it, but they've Pretty never... Pretty much any time, like, bar Waluigi Pinball, I think, whenever... And uh, the Wario Mine stage, Wario and Waluigi like overwhelming, overwhelmingly get this kind of stage, like some kind of stadium or stunt track or, like I think uh, Wario's stage in Double Dash was based off of like the sort of a dirt bike dome that you'd see in like monster truck rallies. Right. It, it Just, was uh, War Wario Coliseum, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe that's why they haven't brought it back. It's just they they they're kind of stuck in a rut, you know. Uh, DK's Jungle Parkway didn't come back until for whatever reason they were just giving Donkey Kong snow levels, <laughs> snow tracks, uh, like ski ski slopes for like two generations. So I don't know, but yeah, Wario Stadium. Um, another thing I really like about it too, it's one of the only tracks that has a full audience watching you the entire time. And, you know, I just love the idea that these characters are actually competing in front of hundreds of thousands of people. And there's this, this thrilling sense that in-universe, you, you know, if, if you're playing as Donkey Kong, all these people in the Mushroom Kingdom are watching you yeah. kick It also has the, the Jumbotron, too. The jump, the jump, which uh, Luigi Raceway also has. But, yeah, the Jumbotron is an, just another, like, element that kind of adds to the thrill of... Oh yeah, I'm actually in this race that people are watching. As much as I love the uh, the off-road tracks and the things that aren't supposed to be actual raceways, uh, I I love how conceptually thrilling it is to beat the pants off Mario characters as Donkey Kong in front of Mushroom <laughs> Kingdom <laughs> residents. Oh, oh I have and, issues. And uh, I guess since we. I guess I kind of neglected to mention this, but the the, the anti shortcut I was sort of talking about, and this may actually be a reason why they haven't brought this back, is 
I think it's about halfway through Wario Stadium, there is a massive jump off of a dirt ramp. Yes. And there is there is no, like, sort of safe bottom below it. If you fall onto this pit, like, if you get hit with a shell midway through the jump... Or, or a lightning bolt or something. ...don't pick up enough speed, you fall in this pit and you are, like, pretty... You pretty much lost a lot of... You're back in an earlier part of the track. You have lost a significant amount of your progress that you are not going to pick back up. It is possible to catch back up and win. I've done it before, but it's just cumbersome, and you have to get really lucky. So. And I'm just thinking in, in in the sort of games where, like, say... Like that, that track in Mario Kart Wii with, where you have to hop on the mushrooms and constantly get bombarded by shells and bombs mm. and everything else and a single mistiming sends you off the edge maybe that's why this hasn't quite come back yet or at least one of the reasons just you you're bombarded by a lot more stuff in the newer games that could mess yeah. you up in this stage yeah Th that that's a good point too um i don't know i it just it's just weird though you know it's it's one of the iconic stages of the granted this is a game where m most of the stages are iconic but and that's why they brought back 15 out of the 16. But I don't know. Just, just yeah, why exclude that one? Oh, well. Royal Raceway. Oh, my God. Royal Raceway. This is just one of those. Th this this is a, a track that went on. It was such a conceptual success that everybody who made a game, be it Mario Kart or a, a Mario game, game with a heavy, heavy multiplayer bent to it would try to replicate the magic of this track and and since then i think a lot of the allure has been taken away but it can't be stressed enough how cool this was at the time and what makes this track so successful be it besides some of the cool things like the giant ramp jump that you have in it it's that the castle from super mario 64 peach's castle the entire courtyard essentially slightly scaled down but the entire courtyard is essentially in this track and you can just go off the track for no reason it, it, you will lose if you do this but you can go off the track and drive around the courtyard I, from super I mario 64 love this. i love this i love this um, there's even like a little i remember there's a note in the manual for mario kart 64 that like advises you not to leave the course at this specific junction but yeah. it's it's so worth it to do i love being able to basically drive around the faithfully recreated or ported over whatever you want to call it courtyard from super mario 64 and it's just there and again that you can just sort of imagine that all this time in Super Mario 64 on the other side of that hill was all this being prepared. Yeah, yeah, I know. And there's the first uh, example of Peach uh, kind of landscaping her courtyard to fit whatever sport that, that she, is not she a was euphemism. <laughs> I am sorry. I didn't actually intend that. No, uh, hey, lads. But <laughs> no, whatever sport she's currently obsessed with, she'll just tear up her. There's no good way to phrase this now. <laughs> Thanks, Cameron. And and again, this this kind of became a tired trope, and and eventually it stopped making sense. But th this game came out just a couple months after Super Mario 64, which was kind of one of those flashpoints, one of those landmark games. And to have this replicated in this game, it's not something that really we were used to. I mean, it was really cool when Super Mario World featured a sunken airship from Super Mario Brothers 3. That it bore no resemblance to the airships from Super Mario Brothers 3. But just the, the conceptual link between the two was really cool. And then it was really cool when the Gangplank Galleon kept coming back in, in the first few Donkey Kong games made by Rare. But this took it to a whole nother level. This was a recreation of the actual courtyard from Super Mario 64 here in this Mario Kart game for no reason other than it would be a cool thing to do. And here you could drive around as Donkey Kong in a go-kart 
in the courtyard from Super Mario 64. Huh. And, of course, when they brought it back, they railed off that section where you couldn't do it anymore. Completely nullifying <laughs> the whole appeal of the fucking... Tr oh, God. <laughs> anyway. Mm. That, that pisses me off. Like, Mario Kart 8 did so much right. How could it screw that up? I, I don't like how confined everything feels in Mario Kart 8. It feels like they're trying to keep you from having too much fun. Well, anyway, um, the flip side of Royal Raceway is Bowser's Castle. And this is another track that it's just filled with a lot of cool things. And granted, this is not based on an actual locale from any of the game. I mean, it is based on, you know, the myriad of Bowser's castles that appeared throughout the Mario series. But it's not based on a specific one like Royal Raceway is for Peach. So, Bowser's Castle... I think of a few things when I think of this track, but I think the thing that everybody goes to is that thwomp that's for no reason behind bars. The, the green thwomp. Yeah. The green thwomp. And the amount of urban legends that this fucker has spawned. I remember the week this game came out, people at school, and my my uh, alma mater of uh, Montevideo Middle School. Oh, God. So much painful memories there. But people were talking about like spreading bullshit about this thwomp behind the cage that oh there was a way that you could get in that cage or that the cage would open up and the thwomp would attack you or all sorts of things that had no bearing in reality just what did this thwomp do that Bowser <laughs> locked him up <laughs> I know right <laughs> And, what uh, could this swamp do? Yeah. Oh, as a uh, Cuban in the chat is saying, uh, Marty kind of became the 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 name that they used. People used for him online. Yeah, I'm aware of that, but I don't know where that came from. Is it just was it just some sort of in joke at some website that just kind of caught on? In in a way that our, our in jokes never do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, exp if you can explain where Marty hey, came from, Cuban. Hey, hey. It's not Marty Day in a few days. What? Oh, I got you. I got you. Yeah. Copcock Day will catch on, Cameron. Kind it, of it, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of horrifying, yeah. Uh, but so, I, I think you kind of nailed it about Bowser's Castle. It It's a track with a lot of cool shit in it, and that's what you remember about it. it it's a visually interesting track i mean you go downstairs you go you know there, there's like you loop around you jump over lava pits uh there's the the fire breathing bowser statues uh yeah it's it's just a visually striking track and it, it, you definitely felt like this was like an extension of bowser's uh palace like you, you know, i i imagine bowser to have like numerous buildings that make up his his castle estates in these lava pits in in the mushroom world, and uh, I, I imagine this is just one of many that that he resides in. But I could actually see him living here too. Like it it, it feels very much like just this place where this weird ass tyrant hangs out. The, the, the ominous chorus and the music is good is great too. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's talk about our home track, as far as DK Vine is concerned, DK's Jungle Parkway. Um, yeah, uh, there's really nothing related to Donkey Kong in this track at all, b besides it being vaguely jungle-themed. And I, I, I don't know if, if this is something they actually had in the works before Donkey Kong became a playable character, and they just slapped Donkey Kong's name on it because, hey, it's a jungle track. I kind of wonder if that's the case because I think there's like a a weird screenshot from like the early version of the game with either Kamek or some whatever character it is is just represented on screen as like this purple shape with like yellow stars over him, and they're in DK's Jungle Parkway. So I have to wonder. If it was like a generic 3D jungle that they sort of retrofitted Donkey Kong's name onto, realizing 
this is such a blatantly good fit. And I'm fine with it. Like, I can theoretically believe that this takes place in the Congo jungle just fine because they don't go... I mean, there's nothing overtly cartoony really about it. It, it feels like a jungle. No, it's if it's an if it's an accident or a coincidence, it feels purposeful, so you don't really mind it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it granted it doesn't look like Rare's Donkey Kong jungles from Donkey Kong Country with the the plasticky, shiny, rounded palm trees, but it doesn't need to. Um, and I can suspend my disbelief for you know the, the time I play it that yeah. This is uh, this is somewhere in the uh, expanse of Donkey Kong's home jungle, and uh, granted, you do have that uh, river boat that um, has like Mario's name on it, but I always just took that as uh, Mario, you know, or, or whatever, running uh, river boat tours while they were racing, and not nothing really uh, that is a permanent fixture of of this river maybe that's why all the natives throw coconuts at you in this level they just yeah so so, so pissed that mario has brought this onto their environment well are they coconuts or are they durian fruits or something like that because they're spike <laughs> spiky kind of I, I don't know what they're supposed to be i think they're just some sort of weird made-up fruit but they might be i think they might be like designed as durians but maybe i, I... shrunk down a little bit like, I, I have coconut in my head for some reason. I don't know if that was, like, what they were localized as, or I just, in my ignorance, assumed. No, I, I mean, I've seen them referred to as coconuts in the the American literature, which never made sense, because they look nothing like I, coconuts. It, it, it's like the it, it's like the Pokemon anime uh, localizing rice balls as donuts and not changing what they actually look like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, you know, just l embrace it. Like... I didn't know what a durian fruit was until I watched Bizarre Foods with Andrew Zimmern. Um, and then, you know, because it's not something that's imported here. Um, I, I've tried them uh, when I did Put It In Your Mouth LA with uh, Chad and Jeremy. Uh, we I tried durian fruit then, and it's the smell is god-awful. But um, it, it also costs like $50 or something ridiculous because uh, it costs so much money to import. And they have it in like uh, import imported grocery stores, like Asian grocery stores, on the west coast of the U.S. But here on the east coast, it's not a thing you ever see. And um, it's like a custardy kind of texture. Anyway, I'm going way off track here. But uh, Jungle Beat had a dirty. Well, that, that's what Mario too. Kart 64 is all about. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, they, they say like the locals, like monkeys in the trees are throwing these at you, but they just appear out of nowhere and hit you. And uh, so I always just took it that it's just, they're just falling from the trees and there's just a bounty of them and they're in season and falling off the trees. Um, it should also be pointed out too, this ties into the whole ghost save data. Every time you are mildly inconvenienced by anything, you cannot save your ghost data. It, it in seems time to track. be if you hit any physical object that's not a static part of the track. Yeah, which was really annoying in this track because you go slightly off course, you get hit by one of these fruits. You can't save your ghost data. Yeah. Um, or if you pause the time trial, I remember that being <laughs> the case too. It was so. This was clearly such a finicky part of the game. Yeah, yeah. They, they they didn't really have time to iron out the kinks, but they really wanted to justify the controller pack to get it out on the market. So, yeah, I think that's why it's so fucking half-assed in this game. Uh, the, the, yeah, I, I don't know. DK's Jungle Parkway, I have a lot of fond memories of. And also, I like that they kind of tie back into it in Super Circuit with Lakeside Park. Because I always just felt like that was deeper into this 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 park this uh i don't know national park on donkey kong island or or you know state park or whatever you want to call it and um you yeah, know i like that lakeside park doesn't really have any donkey kong branding apparent to it at first and you just kind of but it is you look a bit closer and it is appropriate to him yeah you know it's funny donkey kong didn't really have an appropriate mario kart track up until mario kart 7 
It took Retro Studios to co-develop a game to have a Donkey Kong track with actual Donkey Kong things in it. Which is pretty sad. Actually, I take that back. The, uh, the arcade games had them. Um, developed by Namco. Our good friends at Namco who made Donkey Konga. They, uh, they had Diddy uh, sitting on the sidelines. They had ostriches that uh, you know were resembled espresso. Rambi was on the sidelines too, I believe. Yeah, yeah, in, in one of them. So they had them, but as far as the home Mario Kart games go, Mario Kart 7 was the first one. Uh, but I, I like DK's Jungle Parkway. I do, and I remember when we found out it was coming back for Mario Kart Wii, I was so happy to see it again. And, like, now that Mario Kart Wii has been out and Mario Kart Wii was what it was, my opinion on it is kind of... It has my favorite roster of any Mario Kart game and some of my favorite returning tracks, but it's just... I don't enjoy playing it for a myriad of reasons that would take a whole episode to get into. Yes, and we'll save it for the Mario of, Kart Wii Spotlight. I'm kind of wishing they had reserved this for a later title, because I would have loved to see this get the Mario Kart 8-style treatment. Then again, it's the only chance you have to go around DK's Jungle Parkway with Diddy or Funky Kong, so... Embrace it while you can. Well, that's a problem I have with Mario Kart 8, but... <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah, that, that's the biggest problem. Let's not get into that. that that's, that's two big problems I have with Mario Kart 8. The character selection and the lack of exploration. That's But everything else I think is stellar. And it would surpass Mario Kart 64 in some ways if uh, if it actually you know rectified that. But as far as comparing it to Double Dash and Mario Kart Wii, it's leagues apart. Okay. So, oh, one more thing about DK's Jungle Parkway real quick. Did you know about the shortcut... The, the game-breaking shortcut in this track. Does this involve the ramp? Uh, no, it involves the cave. Which was also truncated in Mario Kart Wii. They made it so the ramp could only send you directly in front of it. Right, which I didn't like. But no, the cave, um, near the end of the cave, and you could actually go back in reverse at the start and drive towards the very edge of the cave on... on on the right or left if you're driving out of the cave but there was a point you could hit you could jump just right and you could jump through the uh the, t the polygons and just fall off the map entirely and then lack of two would pick you up and you could drive to the finish line and it would count as a lap hmm. so uh see that's interesting to know but i can't see myself ever doing it because why would you want to be on DK's Jungle Parkway and not drive the entire thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, that that's one of those that it, it's cool that it exists, but it's much more fun to actually play the game. It was like I was watching uh, footage because I was like um, doing a post about Quox on the Facebook page the other day. Um, the history of Quox and his brother Squawk, formerly Squeaks and Flapper on DK Vine. But uh, I, I was doing a history, and I was, so I was just watching videos of Parachute Panic just uh, as a kind of a refresher course. And the amount of people on YouTube who just blow through Parachute Panic by using Dixie and don't ever grab um, any of the purple parrots. And I'm just like, mm. well, yeah, that's fine for speedrunning, but you're kind of like missing the joy of the stage itself, which is using the parrots as a, you know, a, a parachute. All right, Jeez, whatever. Four quacks. Feels neglected. <laughs> I know. Yoshi Valley. This is a weird, weird track because this is Yo this is Yoshi's home course, but it really has nothing to do with Yoshi save for the giant egg. <laughs> and I always, you know, they, they rectified this in Mario Kart 8 by having a Yoshi preserve <laughs> on it, but at the time, uh, there is nothing really to signify this was a Yoshi track. I, I fan wanked it at the time that this was on Yoshi's Island. I think now Mario Kart 8 implies it's not on Yoshi's Island. It's it's a Yoshi preserve off of Yoshi's Island. But are, wait, are that that's a really clever bit of like retconning something to have more world building in it, but if it if it's a Yoshi preserve, are are people shooting Yoshis? <laughs> I know. I assume Yoshi Preserve meant it was like a sanctuary for Yoshi's and not like a game preserve. I don't know. 
I, I would hope well, not. Well, that's what I mean. If it's protecting them from something, what is it protecting them from? <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just difficult for Yoshi's to live off of Yoshi's Island, and they they need it, like a closed off. I don't know. Maybe maybe like they require certain dietary restrictions that only they can only be provided in an enclosed environment. It's a, it's a silver lining, maybe that. Uh... Saberman's ties to this to uh, Donkey Kong via Banjo grew over time. Th this would have ended badly. <laughs> <laughs> so this track is infamous because there's a number of different paths you could take through this like sweeping valley canyon. But here's my question, Cameron, and I never understood this. Why can't the game? seem to track who's in first place because i don't think it should be that confusing for the game to track the progress of my Cause, theory cause, my cause, theory let me is just explain for those who sure. have forgotten this is the one track in the game where you can't tell who's in first place who's in second place who's in third place and who's in fourth place you just have question marks the whole time up until somebody actually finishes and then you see oh somebody just finished and they finished in first place well, my theory on that is, and again, somebody who knows more about how the AI functions in this game, please correct me if I'm wrong. My theory is that it totally can, and it's a deliberate choice that the game is um, not sharing this information with you. And the reason I think that is because, you know how in Mario Kart 64 you can alter your, your UI to show the... There's a, there's a UI option where you can show a a rectangular outline around the screen that shows where each driver is. Yes. If you have that set on, on this track, certain icons will react if, say, a driver spins out, or a driver pulls really far ahead, or it, basically it seems to me, at least from my memory, that they line up relative to whichever driver they correspond to in their placement. So I suspect, in a way, the game can track who is where and just chooses not to, either as a presentation thing or to hide when maybe it screws up or just as, like, a nifty little one-track gimmick for Yoshi Valley. Yeah, I, th I think gimmick, is, yeah, is, is the reason, which it's fine, um... It it, it it was just it, it it always felt like cheap to me like yeah yeah it, it's a cool gimmick but i can see through it. it it's a very inconsequential thing because i mean come on you know who's ahead of you yeah um the only other thing i can think of about this track that makes it memorable is that you can blow through the giant egg if you have a star which is nice <laughs> wait i also have never understood the logistics of that giant egg is that just like an enormous Yoshi that laid that, or is it kind of uh, a prop? Is it just there as a track obstacle built in homage to the Yoshis that it isn't actually there? Or did did a Yoshi like swallow a giant creature and <laughs> lay that egg? I, I don't I don't understand. Of course, I don't understand how Yoshi's biology works, come to think of it, because... If that's they... a real egg, this is kind of a lousy sanctuary to put it in a place where carts are driving through. Yeah, again, yeah, they uh, the, the lawyers must have really cleaned up after Mario Kart 64. Um, Alright, by the way, we are in the special cup at this point, starting with DK's Jungle Parkway. And it should be pointed out that you don't have to unlock the special cup in this game. Which I always found to be a weird choice, because even reading Nintendo Power in the lead-up to the game, they said you would have to unlock the special cup, and that's not the case. So I wonder what made them decide to just give gamers all 16 tracks from the get-go. Now that I think about it, yeah, the I believe the only unlockables in the entire game are Mirror Mode and the title screen that comes with it. Yeah, which I love the new title screen because it has Donkey Kong front and center. <laughs> anyway, uh, Banshee Boardwalk. This is the, uh, again, a, a spiritual successor to a Super Mario Kart, the Boo tr tracks. 
but this one uh it, rather than taking place on a nebulous like wooden plank up in the air it's actually a boardwalk out at sea and i don't know i like this uh, but this is also one that's memorable for i think two reasons one the bats that fly out um, in the interior room. If, if I'm not mistaken, I think that was another thing that could screw up your time trial. Yeah, oh, of course it was. Which it I was. would imagine it did so constantly because I would get that notification in the game and wonder, well, wait, what the heck did I hit? And remember, yeah. it was the bats. There was really no way to avoid those bats most of the time. And then, of course, the giant fish that, that jumped out of the water that we would later learn was the trophy spitting balloon or whatever i i'm never really quite clear was the trophy spitting spitting balloon and i assume it was a balloon was it based off of this fish or was that the trophy spitting balloon just going haywire and flying up and down uh banshee boardwalk i i i feel like well it is the same fish you see in that sequence and i I feel like it was it was taking off from Super Mario Kart's thing with that, but yeah, the deal with that fish was always kind of odd to me. I mean, I, I think it's clearly a living creature, but but like was the gag when they did it in Super Mario Kart that it was like the Goodyear blimp analog or I don't know. Again, I think I think this is like this would make sense had I grown up in Japan uh, in the early '90s. Maybe this would be a really, like, funny joke, but I, as an American, I'm completely clueless what they're going for with this fish. Uh, so I, I just rolled with it, you know? It, it's just one of those weird charms of the game that I, I don't really understand it, but I accept it. All right, well, let's wrap up our look at the tracks and then move on to, um, I guess, our final thoughts about Mario Kart 64. But we've got to talk about it because I think... Cameron, we're in agreement probably that this is our favorite track in the game. I don't know. It is mine. It, it's definitely made an influence on DK Vine over the years, clearly. At the, at the very least, this is a track with a recurring theme, and this is my favorite iteration of it in okay. any Mario Kart that's seen fit to put it in. I, I think that's the best way to put it, too. It might not be my favorite track in the game, but it is the out of all of these tracks... Under the, this banner, this is my favorite iteration of Rainbow Road. Um, the the finest Rainbow Road in existence because it is the most leisurely Rainbow Road. It, it's the, the antithesis best... of every other Rainbow Road. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is another point. The purist in those gaming magazines I read had an issue with. They hated this version of Rainbow Road, and I hated them for hating it because this rainbow road it, it goes the opposite direction where you think it would instead of being the hardest track in the game it's a victory lap it's a celebration it's okay you got through some pretty difficult tracks there here here's a joyful sprawling huge track that you cannot fall off of unless you try to fall off of and uh enjoy and this is a track with one of the coolest aesthetics, I think, of any Rainbow Road, and the the combination of you, you, you seem to be, if not in space, and at least high high up enough in the sky that you can't see land beneath you, and which uh, I believe Mario Kart 8 uh, sullies a bit, or th does it? Yeah, Mar Mar I don't like what Mario Kart 8 did with this version of Rainbow Road in any It, it shortened respect. it, so I already have problems. It shortened it, and it added a train, a flying train, like it was uh, Back to the Future Part 3. I, I don't know, but and the, the this, neon the neon heads, Cameron. Yeah, the neon heads. This, The aesthetic of this track does a lot with a little. And I remember loving the hell out of this track when I first found it. Because... I'm a, yeah. I would go the like the, I remember going around this track for the very first time and seeing like the very first few neon heads and I remember every time, single time I turned a corner, I was thinking, oh man, who am I gonna see next? What's it gonna look like? Mm -hmm. This this was a celebration of 
Mario Kart 64 in its entirety. It, it was a victory lap for you, but it was a victory lap for the game. And, you know, I'm a fan of a, a certain kind of aesthetic, I've realized. Like, um, it's what Chad and I would always refer to as um, spaciness. And and so I've, I even started a, uh, a weekly DK Vine Facebook page fe feature called Your Saturday Night Screen Grab of Spaciness just based on my love of kind of these these sci-fi aesthetics and and this is i think my favorite um in all of video games just something about it there's this mix of fantasy and sci-fi and just i don't know it i, I go back to that dreamlike aesthetic this is the most dreamlike track in the game and it is. Between... this is this is a dreamlike track it it really helps the music use. and the the design and the everything about and it. I mean, just the nebulousness of th there is no like clear indication of where you are in this. Mm -hmm. You you are in a you are in a black void. There's no like earth below you, no moon in the sky. You're just there. Yeah, and it's something that later Rainbow Roads, they, later Rainbow Roads would always try to contextualize what was going on like the rainbow road in double dash was above mushroom city and which is fine you know but it then takes away from the endless charm of this rainbow road where yeah it, it, it's it's ambiguous but it doesn't matter because it's just magic it's magic made manifest in the game and it obviously had a big effect on dk vine as i said because <laughs> For uh, the better part of the aughts, our site design was based not on any rare game, but on Mario Kart 64's Rainbow Road. We went th to this, and it was a terrible look. It was a terrible look. It was a god-awful design, but from 2004 to uh, 2010, my god. We had a neon, it's like six years. The longest, the longest site design we ever had was was this look. And and vestiges of it still exist uh, via the the forum, which we've kind of moved away from everything. Like most bits of aesthetic from those years, but we kept the neon head avatars that all of our forum users use. We couldn't we, part with and, them. No. It's, it's just... such a good. It's, su it's such. A, it's such a. Like simple concept, but it's so thrilling whenever you see it, and it, it makes the form look a little bit magical, just like this track is magical. And I mean, they they've never been able to, like, recreate how cool those neon heads were. And every like iteration of Rainbow Road after every gimmick it's had, it's never really tapped into the same. That's perfect feeling that yeah. the Neon Heads did, and I, I, I don't know. I I could really go for another Rainbow Road like this, because I remember liking... I mean, part of it is the aesthetic. It's all the pieces coming together. It's the aesthetic. It's how, real, how absurdly long the track is, how the only hazards in it are those chomps that only come by once in a while. The silver the, chomps, too. Yeah. The, the music, the railings everywhere. It, this is this is not the final gauntlet the game is throwing at you. This is this is a cool down after everything you've just gone through. No, it's like you've died and you've this gone is, to heaven. This this is an interactive reward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I I I was toying with the idea and <laughs> after the uh, tumultuous uh rollout of the DKC3 design and the, the Russian hacking and the site going down for a week and a half. Uh, I, I, I completely abandoned the idea, but I would have loved to uh, not have a new site design, but have a new forum skin that does justice to this aesthetic in a way that our site design for six years didn't. Like, I would love to have a Rainbow Road aesthetic for the forum. For all those, you know, people who, you know, love the neon heads... To give the neon heads a natural form skin, just for once, um, it, it would be cool to have um, somewhere down the line have a rainbow road skin for the forum. I don't know, um, 
but we'll maybe we'll we'll save that for the 25th anniversary of Mario Kart 64. All right, well, before we wrap up this episode, we do have a couple of listener calls to take. People wanted to share their thoughts about Mario Kart 64, so let's let them have the platform. Hey there, this is Hero of Tiffany on the forums. Um, I'm calling in for the Mario Kart 64 episode, and I don't really have as many memories from that one specifically, but I know the impact it had, Smithing Mario Kart, and of course, Donkey Kong being with Mario in a bunch of games. But that's not the point I have for today. So you guys are experts on the banana, I know. And I was wondering if y'all had an answer to this. So in, I guess in Mario Kart 64 and carrying on, all the banana items, they always had eyes. And later on they started having, like, smiley faces. What's the deal with that? Like, did they just take a bunch of DK's banana peels and just decide to put smiley faces on them and use them? Or is there some kind of other force? Like, are they a kind of alien-like, what's his name, Zenonab, I think, one of the, some, like, jungle climber? And they just enjoy getting run over at the expense of someone someone's car. So... Yeah, I don't. I guess that's it. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, thank you for the call. And this is actually something I'm glad that you brought up because I would have been uh, regretting seriously not bringing up this issue of the banana peels in this game with little eye marks on them. And Cameron, initially I tried to just write this off when I played the game. I tried to ignore that those were supposed to be eyes. I thought they were just like brown specks on the banana peel, you know, that that made me look like eyes. And that that let me kind of overlook it. Despite the fact that in Mario games, you know, fire flowers have eyes, mushrooms have eyes. Why wouldn't the banana peels have eyes too? And it, it's interesting that yeah, the the banana peels have eyes, but then later on in the Donkey Kong Country series, we'd be introduced to things like the banana sprites from Retro's Donkey Kong games that basically are flying bananas with uh, eyes. So I don't know if there's any correlation between that and these, or if these are just Mushroom Kingdom bananas that have eyeballs on them because plant life has eyeballs in the mushroom world what do you think i mean that's a that is a really interesting one um because uh yeah mario kart 64 didn't have the face um did super mario kart have the faces i can't remember i think they had the eyes i mean if uh if you want my like on the spot like made up uh fan and answer maybe uh Maybe Donkey Kong was supplying the banana peels from uh, Donkey Kong Island for Mario Kart 64, and then, and I assume Super Circuit, and then something happened between that and Double Dash, where they just suddenly weren't supplying them anymore. Well, I mean... Waste of good food stuffs, maybe. Super Mario Kart um, had the eyes, Mario Kart 64 continued the eyes, and then... Really, it did? I didn't remember the... Uh, I, I guess my mental image of the Mario Kart 64 banana is based on the, the toy. Yeah, that, no. Uh, no, Mario that, Kart 64, they have eyes on the banana. It's uh, severely upsetting when you consider biting into something that might be able to scream. Of course, this doesn't have a mouth, so I guess it wasn't able to scream. I don't well, that, know. That raises all kinds of questions. Like this is this is a banana peel, explicitly not a banana. So, and it seems content with itself. So, are you are you eating the internal organs, or is the peel the scent? Uh, I don't this, even. This raises too many questions. <laughs> Of course, I mean, granted, these these philosophical questions were already brought up in the 
and Donkey Kong series because you have things like Banana Birds, uh, Banana Fairies, the Banana Aliens, and then the Banana Sprites. It's just, oh, oh okay, so these uh, creatures are then made of banana. Could you then just bite into them? Did, uh, wh- how does that work? And why would evolution ever deem that to be an acceptable route to travel? I mean, I am certainly thankful for this caller's uh, idea that maybe the bananas enjoy being run over because um, that that raises another set of questions. The wanton uh, cruelty. Well, but they're also just the banana peel. So are their innards cleaned out? Are these actually just like the skin of dead bananas in the Mushroom Kingdom? Because, anyway, where do these shells come from, too? Like, that that's another thing. You, you've got, like, not in Mario Kart 64, but in a lot of Mario Karts, you've got a, a Koopa Troopa and a Paratroopa racing in these events. How do they feel about hurling the, the remains of their dead brothers and sisters at other racers? It, it would be like if NASCAR drivers, you know, threw skulls into the, you know, wheels of racers behind them and in front of them it it would be uh, severely morbid and off-putting yeah and i mean <laughs> even that's kind of and then you get into like like super mario world kind of treats like the shells as just like a piece of clothing they wear but then dry bones have skeletal shells and uh you know cameron i'm starting to wonder if the mario series isn't that well thought out I don't know. No, couldn't be. Uh, thank you for the call. Hey, Chad. Hey, Heil. This is Banjo Mac from the forums. I'm just calling in regards to uh, Mario Kart 64. I had a lot of good memories with that particular game. Uh, and I really like that they kind of carried on that tradition from the Super Nintendo um, Mario Kart where they had a bevy of characters. I really understand that they were kind of limited uh, right when the SNES came out to how many they could add, but I think they did a good job extrapolating that roster, and uh, yeah, I was really excited to see Donkey Kong be a part of that, so um, yeah, just giving my love out to Mario Kart 64. You guys do a great job. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the call, and by the way, I should point out that we get these uh, calls through our DK Vine hotline, but then Google Voice, which is actually where we have the uh, the mailbox set up, provides a rough transcript of, of the call. And so when when I play it, I I can uh, see the the transcript. So when you said a, a bevy of characters, Google translated that as they had a baby of characters. And that's just amusing to me, considering where the Mario Kart roster selections would eventually go, which is an assortment of baby characters and other nonsensical variants that ultimately drag down the quality of the roster. And, you know, I've had people argue to me, well, why do you hate the roster of Mario Kart 8 when Mario Kart 64 had, you know, less characters? Why? I mean, isn't it better to have more characters? But I would argue that it's better to have quality characters more than anything. And I think the Mario Kart 64 cast is just so quintessential, so essential, that you know it, it's not mucked up by having also rans and just weird uh, joke characters of just padding out the roster, you know? It, it is funny when I think on it that, like, my biggest... Uh, uh, sort of complaint with Mario Kart 8, as petty as it sounds, is that it doesn't have Diddy Kong in it. (laughs) And I don't hold that against Mario Kart 64. But Uh, it's also, you don't... It would would be like Christians saying that anybody born before Jesus is in hell. You know, you can't really blame Mario Kart 64 for not having Diddy because there's no precedent for having Diddy. Uh, But once once Diddy was introduced... Yeah, it's it's a problem because of Double Dash and Mario Kart Wii conditioning you to expect Diddy. Along yeah, I with mean, most it, Mario spinoffs in, it, in the modern it, age. It was a problem with Mario Kart DS and Mario Kart 7, but at least then you could rationalize, well, I guess Diddy just doesn't appear in the portable Mario Karts, but we're to expect him in the console versions. 
Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's honestly, it's the lack of Diddy, the lack of Birdo, the lack of all of these characters that were introduced that were excluded for not very good reasons. When And then padding out the roster with essentially clone characters. It's the same issue I have with Smash Brothers where, oh, they don't have time to develop further characters, so they're just going to throw in uh, characters with copied movesets. I think it's a testament to how kind of off Mario Kart 8's roster is that it actually got me to go to bat for Bowser Jr. and Birdo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't really have an issue with Bowser Jr. anymore. I remember when he first was a character uh, in Super Mario Sunshine, how it just felt like Nintendo was trying to retcon their history and ignore the Koopalines or the Koopa Kids or whatever their official names are now. But uh, now, ironically enough, I'm okay with Bowser Jr., but I'm getting tired of the seven Koopalines. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I mean, don't misunderstand me. I don't have anything against either character. They're just not... Like, if I saw them on the select screen, they probably wouldn't be characters I'd regularly pick except to, for 100% completion purposes. Yeah. But it just seems so fundamentally off, considering they were in the previous ones. And it's not like, say, like, say something like Snake not being in Smash Brothers anymore, or like the like a Roy getting traded out in Super Smash Brothers Brawl where there's like behind the scenes reasons or rationale you can kind of see well yeah that's understandable these are Mario universe characters that have kind of been around for quite a while and it's just odd to see them dropped well Cameron I think we all know the good reason why they dropped Diddy Kong hashtag I believe in Kevin Callahan all right Cameron well what are your final thoughts on Mario Kart 64? The very first cameo game, the very first uh, game to feature Rare's Donkey Kong, not fully developed by Rare, even though Rare did have a hand in it. And um, yeah, the first uh, first DKU game on the N64 at that. Well, to this day, I even with all the fa- faults that become increasingly apparent as the game ages i still really enjoy mario kart 64 um i enjoy it alongside diddy kong racing and even if like later games like mario kart 8 is maybe a maybe in terms of just sheer number of things it gets right and does a solid time of executing the best mario kart game currently out there but I think Mario Kart 64 is still my favorite, which is kind of saying something considering it. This is this is a game with half the tracks that its sequel sequels would come to have. It doesn't have Diddy or Funky in it, but it's just I get such a you know it's a warm and fuzzy kind of game. I still really really love it. Yeah, I mean. Like I said, I love Mario Kart 8. Obviously, Diddy Kong Racing is my favorite kart racer. Based on the type of gamer I am, that's a game that's kind of designed for my taste. But Mario Kart 64, man, it's still my favorite Mario Kart to this day. It's still my favorite Mario Kart. And I don't know. I think it was just the perfect congruence of events. It was... It came out at just the right time. It was early enough on the N64 that they couldn't, like push it so you had this weird hybridization of the sprite characters in the polygonal world i don't know it, they they didn't really have the pastel look of the mario series that they went with from the gamecube era to the wii u era they didn't have that finalized so you had a little bit more realism dabbled in there and the game is just fun to play. I mean, it's just so much fun to power slide through those turns and find shortcuts. And um, the fact that you could play as Donkey Kong, my Donkey Kong, our Donkey Kong, just made it so much more meaningful. It was the first time we had Donkey Kong playable on the N64. The first time we had him in a 3D game at that. Granted, his uh, carburetor voice, or whatever you want to call it, was a bit weird. And it stuck around forever, up until we got the Scooby-Doo voice. But, um... I'm fond of it. I, I have warm, fuzzy memories of it. 
Uh, this the game. I mean, Donkey Kong looks better in Mario Kart 64 than he looks on any of these other N64 outings, like uh, Mario Party or Super Smash Brothers, with his cone head appearance. Uh, by the way, I, I I'm looking up Mario Kart 64 on Wikipedia right now, and I I see the part I edited years ago. <laughs> it's still on there, under development. I said Rare Limited, developer of the Donkey Kong Country games, provided Donkey Kong's character model. I was the one who added that to the Wikipedia page. Um, I, I I like Mario Kart 64. It's it's not my favorite, but it's a game I'm always going to cherish. And it was also important in that it got an N64 into my home. It It's a game I played endlessly throughout the rest of winter, spring, and summer, and even early fall of 1997 and yeah diddy kong racing came out and i played it less but it's a game i still picked up time and again throughout the rest of the n64's lifespan it's a game i just downloaded for the virtual console and i've been playing on the wii u as of late it's it's a game that holds up even when all of its flaws are made apparent as you said through age and through games coming out that do what it does better there's still a certain raw charm to it that hasn't been replicated since then. And I think speaks to the game's innate charm. This is, I mean, the soundtrack to this game uh, was uh, what Kenta Nagata did the uh, soundtrack for this one. It, it's fantastic. It is, I think, the best Mario Kart soundtrack to this day. There, there's, there's, the synth the the fiddle the steel drums that incorporates it just it it's it's a soundtrack that i would listen to as much as i would listen to a david y soundtrack or a robin beanland soundtrack or a grant kirkhope soundtrack it's right up there with the best of rare it's memorable and- it's catchy it's it transports you to this world in a way that other mario games don't do in fact, if I remember right, one of the early features on DK Vine where you guys used to uh, rank like your top favorite tunes mm-hmm. from DKU games, this was the only one that didn't come from a rare composer. Yeah, yeah, was uh, Rainbow uh, Road. At the very least, it shows we're consistent. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, I I would definitely recommend Mario Kart 64. Obviously, if you're a younger gamer, maybe this game won't mean as much to you, and uh, it, it will feel like a throwback. But you know what? I feel like it's a game every Nintendo fan, every Mario fan, and yes, every Donkey Kong fan should try in their lifetimes. Because not only is it historically important, but it's still... A whole hell of a lot of fun, and it's still probably not probably. I, I'm just gonna say it's still definitively the best Mario Kart game, even by just a, a hair's breadth. You know, Mario Kart 8 does so much right, but where Mario Kart 8 screws things up, Mario Kart 64 just power slides right past it, clips through a polygonal shortcut in the wall, and gets placed at the finish line by Lacka 2. This has been a File 2 production. Hey, Rico.